What makes a house hardcore? There's an old saying with many variations that boils down to tough places breed tough people. It's hard to dispute that. If you can survive in a place that most people cannot, that's exceptional. If you can live there, that's even more so. And if you're born there, born in a place that demands toughness to survive, then that toughness is applicable in many other areas of life. You know, you're not just tough in extreme heat or in extreme cold and then weak about everything else. That doesn't really make sense, does it? With that in mind, location for certainty plays a huge role in making someone hardcore or someone's. Geography is thus at the top of the list, weather, climate. These are, of course, huge factors. It's hard to live in a desert. It's hard to live on the steppes. It's hard to live in semi-permanent winter. But people do it. Absolutely, people do it in real life and in fantasy. Remote locations can be hardcore, but not always. Sometimes a remote location is actually really beautiful, really nice, really a good place to live. The people are good. But when they're not, and when it's combined with harsh terrain, then yes, absolutely. Remote locations that are hard to live in, that's very hardcore. A desert close to a major city is more likely to be survivable than one far from most other humans. I mean, all other things being roughly equal, of course. Maybe the close by desert has, you know, sand monsters in it where the other one has, I don't know, sand angels. But <laughs> None of those things exist in, in this world that I know of. So sometimes the presence of or of proximity to other humans can be part of the problem rather than being near a city. That's a good thing. Well, sometimes those nearby humans aren't so beneficial to be near like pirates or raiders or the like. Or if you live amongst those, maybe you were born into a pirate or raiding culture. If you manage to survive, you're probably stronger all the more for it. Truly the essence of the concept of survival of the fittest in a human perspective rather than a pure nature perspective. Over the long term, these factors like weather and geography and might makes right attitudes can really shape a culture or a region, large or small, or a house in this case, because we're talking about the people that rose to the top of these hardcore subgroups. Some of these hard living cultures started because elite families took over, but others started because someone decided take, to take on the ambitious task of actually building something in one of these hardcore locations that no one already lives in. And you actually build a place to live, start a family and survive a noble family. If a house can build a town, a fort or a castle in such a place, then you might hear them get mentioned today because that's pretty hardcore. The houses we picked for this title and why and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast coming up. Hello and welcome, everybody. Good to have you back this time of year. Our episode schedule is a little spottier and a year is a little more holiday stuff going on, but we still keep it pretty consistent. Episodes most weeks. You can catch us uh, most Sundays. Uh, around this time at three o'clock Eastern and afterwards that's every... 3 p.m. Eastern not 3 a.m. Eastern as today <laughs> I accidentally scheduled our live stream for 3 a.m. and some of you were <laughs> patiently waiting at 3 a.m. excited I'm so sorry yeah I noticed that going to bed I was like what, what? history of Westeros is live in 30 minutes what <laughs> are we <laughs> <laughs> got a little notification there but yeah and you can always catch it later on YouTube or Spotify or any place you catch podcasts. This episode's got a good number of visuals in it. We got some map shots and some sigils because we're, we're going to point that out for most of the houses we talk about. And of course, you can get our episodes ad free on Patreon. And that's a nice thing, isn't it? Sean, what are you, uh, what are you drinking today? I see you got a Better Call Saul uh, GTA mashup shirt there. Yeah, that was pretty back. hardcore. They are pretty, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Better Call Saul takes place in a desert, you know. <laughs> I don't know. My beverages, I feel like they're too sweet usually to be hardcore. Okay. But uh, sometimes, and I mentioned the hardcore. naked drinks, they haven't had the protein ones lately. So I have the Bolt House protein mm. vanilla, it makes this a little creamy, mixed in with the naked green machine, mixed with Magic Mine energy drink. Ooh, Magic Mine. That's cool. And I myself, I don't have my thermos today. I've actually got a Duncan coffee because well why not i treated myself you know and i'm yeah. real bad today i got myself a frozen coke and it's only 3 p.m <laughs> not 3 a.m <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, shout out to our good friend Nina, whose blog can be found at goodqueenally.tumblr.com. That's one L in Alley, as always. That doesn't change, mind you. The number of L's does not change from week to week in that name, in case you thought otherwise. Latest post is talking about the Tullys and Jon Snow and their recognition of him or not. And just that whole situation, what Hoster thought, uh, hierarchies between Starks and Tullys, lo lots of details that fit into that discussion. That's really good. You'll want to check that out. If you have your own questions or your own takes, especially today, this is a good one for feedback. If you have thoughts on which houses you think are the most hardcore that maybe we didn't include, well, say so in the comments. You can do that whether you're listening on podcast or on a video, because these days you should have a way to, uh, even on Spotify, we've got little comment boxes for you. You may not even be aware of that, but they're there. They are there. So lots of ways to give us feedback. Of course, Westeros History at gmail.com if you want to send us an email. Westeros History uh, History of Westeros .com for our website. Anytime we mention something, a link or a sponsor or a way to find one of our bonus episodes or just anything like that, go to our website if you can't recall the instructions we gave you on how to find that. It's all in one place there. We'll start off with our trivia question, as we so often do. Uh, a few months ago, we switched to the format of the trivia question is answered during the episode. So if you're paying attention or if you already know, you'll get the answer to this one. Or actually answers, because today there are two answers. Not every house in this episode do we have 100% clarity on with regards to their founding. But for the most part, we do. We at least have a, an idea or at least an, a notion. Given that, which two houses to be discussed today have and all origins? Not first men, not necessarily... Uh, other <laughs> like unknown things like uh, some other maybe cultures that maybe exist within the first men diaspora but aren't labeled as such so two houses have and all origins keep your eyes out for those how do people adapt to hardcore locations let's let's do a little setup before we get into the main discussion and start naming houses after we meaning humans not the three of us sean shea and i after we evolved, humanity started moving to colder weather places for various reasons, like competition, following migratory animals, just moving away from annoying neighbors, <laughs> things like that. I did move from Atlanta to Denver. I did move to, a, after I evolved, I moved to a colder weather area. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. You really did. <laughs> yeah, and I would say some people moving to Atlanta from somewhere else would also adapt uh, to the extreme <laughs> humidity here compared to, you know, so yeah, I think it goes both ways. You're totally right. And those are very good concepts to understand because there's adapting and there's acclimating. Adapting is a, like a stronger version of acclimating. Acclimating is almost like you get in the pool and it's cold, but a few minutes later it feels fine. You know, uh, that's a short term acclimation. Like the shower is too hot, but a second later you're fine. Moving locations, that's more of a, semi-permanent acclimation like you'll acclimate if you move again but you might have some natural adaptations already in your genetics you might have genes from people that grew up in colder weather and that might have been passed down you might have like inuit blood or aboriginal australian blood two topics that will come up briefly in this episode to describe because they're examples of people that have fairly extreme adaptations that are scientifically understood or at least to a certain degree and our, our small differences in you know come up with small differences in like the way we look and the way our body stores things or our vision or little things like that which we don't have a lot of data for in westeros but it stands to reason that the same factors would be there people westerosi and deserts are going to get acclimated and adapted to heat and and be a little better at, at adapting to thirst and things like that it's People in the north are bigger because cold weather people tend to be bigger because your body protects your internal organs better when there's more like bulk around that. So these are interesting little things about our bodies that matter here. And that's why uh, that's going to come up a lot. One way to adapt can be really quick, uh, just like acclimation, sort of, I guess. But like putting a coat on. That's yes. an adaptation, that, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Like some adaptations are, are physical things our body does, but some things are, our intelligence can adapt by like using tools, putting on clothes. That's one way to adapt. So, Absolutely. Yeah. That so that happen pretty quickly. But when, three when types, physical yeah. adaptations happen consistently over generations, that starts to become evolution. 
Yes, yes. I think I think it's more like not to I'm not disagreeing, but like yeah, it's like acclimation is like the level one, adaptation is like level two, and if evolution is like level three, or maybe it should be even higher than that. But whatever, is there like stages or variations yeah. on this concept? And so we're going to try to define what adapt means real briefly here. Yeah, like Sean and Ashay alluded to, there's genetic stuff, there's physiological stuff. And then what you just said, Sean, like putting on a coat, that's cultural. Like, for example, desert peoples have pretty advanced ways of layering their clothing to trap cold air, to trap cool air as a buffer against heat. Things that like people living in America, we don't know much about that. Uh, I mean, maybe with some exceptions, there's people who do live in deserts in America, but you know, like the three of us, we're not, we don't know much about desert clothing, <laughs> for example. <laughs> you know, I, I know put on a winter coat when it's cold, but someone who lives in cold weather all the time would have a, a little more nuanced view on exactly what to do and layers, layers, layers. exactly. Some of it's pretty coat, basic, yeah. but when you're talking about like living in a spot like that, also you're talking about how you make buildings and, and how you, Mm. distribute water and how you hunt yeah. and things like that those are cultural if you don't evolve that's not an evolutionary trait to wear a coat <laughs> like i think that's <laughs> you don't have to be a scientist to get that concept right other than generically intelligence and use of tools or whatever right you know? so the way this works out in the real world over a long period of time the physiological adaptations are things like natural selection where certain inheritable traits are not passed down because they're not desirable or as desirable or they're not as helpful, right? Like where certain traits are passed down because they are helpful. Yes, absolutely. That's even that's that's the opposite, which is arguably even more important. It's these things manifest in the general subpopulation over a long time. Like if a lot of people value black hair, then the black haired people are more likely to breed and there'll be over time, the culture will become more black haired. That isn't evolution necessarily. They aren't evolved to have black hair. It wasn't an environmental thing that turned their hair black. Well, maybe in, on some level, it may have started that way, but that's not, not what a natural that's, environment. Anymore. That's not what fostered the explosion of black haired people in this example. So again, I use the in Inuit people as an example. They have more blood flowing in their extremities and at a higher temperature than most people in the world. So their blood is actually hotter and it flows more rapidly through their body than most people in the entire world. And this they is live not at higher climates, right? Yes. I don't know if they you live at higher that, but so they need climate. more oxygen. Yeah. yeah. Which is, and this isn't a long-term evolution thing. The Inuits only migrated from the Bering Strait about four or 500 years ago. Evolution plays a way longer scale than that, right? So this isn't pure evolution. This is acclimation or adaptation, physiological, natural selection, things like that. It's more on the lower scale for that. Because they migrated, the Bering Strait is very cold, but they migrated to the Arctic places. It's way four north. Of where they would, yeah. Four or five hundred or a thousand? Hundred. Yes, hundred. Huh. It's, it's impressive. So they how came quickly. at the same time as Columbus or whatever. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, when Columbus was landing in like down south, they were moving from the Bering Sea to, to Alaska and the Arctic Circle and things like that. And northern, what's now northern Canada and things like that. Yeah, it's impressive. Like short period of time. Yeah, I was, I was like, really? Only a few hundred years ago? Like, yeah, that's, mm. that's what I found out. And on the other side of that, some Aboriginal Australian people, they have a lower resting metabolic rate. That means their bodies burn fewer calories doing things like beating your heart and keeping regulating your body temperature. They just it's just a more efficient engine in there. Right. So that's and that's because, well, they've lived in harsher climates like Australia, like Western Australia is barren and hot and it's hard to get food there. And yeah. Uh, like you mentioned high altitude, but also like darker skin is more resistant to sunburn. That's a pretty straightforward adaptation. And uh, genetic, of course, is how those traits are passed down physically. Like you, you may have be gotten darker skin and then eventually time over time that's actually passed down rather than, you know, constantly getting tanned or whatever. <laughs> and now in this world, though, the twist is we have blood magic and sorcery and other things that can factor into it, things that throw a little bit of a curveball at our ability to look at things from purely a scientific perspective, which of course there's problems with looking at it from a purely scientific perspective in this world anyway, but it, for the most part, it's a functional model. It helps us. I mean, think of the Targaryens continuing to have peculiar and horrific dragon babies. That's not an evolution. <laughs> That's not an adaptation. That's sorcery. That is just like, there is no scientific explanation for that that I know of. Not that I'm an expert or anything, so maybe that doesn't mean a whole lot that I don't know of it. But still, <laughs> it is uh, 
it's something out mostly out of this world. If you're a real scientist as yeast, you would know that blood magic is true. <laughs> <laughs> so cultural, like you said, anything that is that comes from that, like if your culture decides to give extra weight to dark hair or red hair, or they decide to throw babies with tentacles into the well, you know, that's just, so your babies with tentacles just won't happen, you know, because they keep killing them. It's tragic for the tentacle babies, really. So these, this ensures that traits like that are wiped out. If a culture just re all, relentlessly disposes all their tentacle babies, eventually you won't see tentacle babies born at all. Did you see any Spartans with tentacles? No. Not a single one. You're right. So the Spartans were doing it right. Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and again, magic can play a big role here. And when you talk about elite families, these are the ones who have gotten the biggest handle on what makes their culture special, what knowledge what cultural knowledge they're at the pinnacle of that they know all the like heat and cold tricks and how to build and distribute and in these environments and they've been doing it for hundreds if not thousands of years so they have a big leg up on what makes them powerful in the first place they have knowledge that is not something that a conqueror could come in and take over very easily which is a lot of times why you have things like the vassal system and things like that because like i Aegon trying to directly rule the Ironborn? Like, no, you need a go-between. You need another Ironborn to rule the Ironborn who then reports to you. Because, like, what does he know about their ways and means and all that? It just, it just doesn't work very well. So, basically, it boils down to climate, food supply, and other supply and danger. Humans are more adapted to heat than cold overall. This one kind of rings intuitively because, well, think about our origins. We started off as primates living in tropical zones. That's our actual origin. Like we are warm weather initially. We we evolved from the out of Africa theory is a prevailing one in terms of where humanity started. There's some challenges to that, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. The point is, have you ever heard of a cold weather primate? Only humans. Humans are the only cold weather primates because we and we didn't evolve in cold weather. In fact, it's kind of neat. The, we outcompeted Neanderthals, supposedly, because we're better at adapting to cold. We are better at adapting to different weathers than, and, and in climates than the Neanderthals. Thus, we spread farther and wider than they did. And over we got a very more food, long time. we had more babies. And yeah, and so we we they got bred out basically over the long time. I don't want to be too contrarian here, but I think there is one breed, one tribe or whatever of uh, baboons that live in an Arctic. Oh, really? Okay. But there's, there's... but there's a hot spring there. Oh. It's <laughs> like bonus warmth they get. Yeah. And th this neatly works out oh. pretty well for us, too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, no, go ahead. Never mind, sir. Okay. So it's this is very similar to how migration worked out in Westeros. So coming in all for a circle, bringing back from the real world stuff, getting into Westeros. Humanity first appeared across the land bridge in Dorne, the hot place, and then gradually went north and filling out the, the nicer places and eventually going north. And, and But there were some places that, you know, they didn't want to go to initially because the places were just so dangerous and harsh. And why go live in the desert when there's no one's living in this nice fertile region yet? I'll take that, right? So this is a conversation we had back when we were covering the very early westeros like the first men and the, the migrations and all that so humans may not have originally evolved on essos there may be like an out of sothorios <laughs> thing like there is an out of africa but we don't know so we have no idea uh so but if, but it is a nice parallel to humans first crossing the bering strait into north america and and, and so forth so uh but also there in in westeros there's the children and the giants and Humans even went to places that the children and the giants didn't want to live. Again, like the deserts, which is similar to the concept I uh, just brought up with regards to humans out competing Neanderthals by being able to go to places they couldn't. So over time, you're going to go to the places your body's most suited for. Humans are first going to pick out the warm, nice places. But over time, those places are all taken. You go to the colder places, and then even those are taken. And then you go to the really harsh places. And that's what we're, that brings us to our topic. That brings us to the houses that live in the really hardcore places, folks that oh, look the secondary and tertiary and even court. And, I don't know the next word. So just <laughs> the fourth best <laughs> spot. Courtiary, courtiary, courtiary. And until all that was left were the worst spots, but the worst spots are still land. Land is the hope, the power and, and hope and promise and life. It's worth the adaptation. It's worth it. If you're ambitious enough and you got the, you got, you know, your druthers, <laughs> you can go for it. 
you know, there's another uh, variable that sometimes humans migrate to, you know, on Earth or in Westeros or whatever. You migrate to an area and, oh, it's nice and warm and beautiful and there's water. And so you chop down some trees and you build a house and you start a garden. And then winter comes and it's freezing cold and the lake <laughs> is frozen over and you know, there's You're not like, enough oh. food anymore. <laughs> but sometimes once you've made that your home, you tough out the winter, spring comes, it's worn again. Then you, with your intelligence, plan for the winter in the future. And overall, it's not as nice, right? It's more harsh in northern Canada than it is in North Carolina. But we can make it work. But sometimes when you get there, you don't realize how hard you're going to have to work to make it yeah. work, right? <laughs> yeah. But and the hardcore ones do it. Do it. The, hard, yeah. the ones that left over there, the, the people that aren't hardcore, they leave and they go back south or whatever. Yeah, they go so. find something easier. They're like, ah, oh, we yeah. just we can't cut it. Yeah, that, I totally agree with that. That's a really good model for for a lot of these. Unless they started small like that, and the ones who stayed eventually gained even more power and maybe expanded or what have you, or maybe someone else came along and took over. But there's there's both examples. You know, there's lots all, all possibilities that can happen here. So Doran was a mix both of early settlements because it was the first land that men came into over the step stone was it just when it was before it was broken it's just one step stone right <laughs> yet it also had step stones there were just more of them <laughs> there's just <laughs> incredibly hard steps so so it was both a place where there were a lot of great initial spots to land and all the spots were like no no one wants to live there but eventually they did anyway because once that was the only thing left <laughs> the the first so the first house has got the choice land so we're not as interested in those today ironwood fowler martell god's grace those are some of the houses that are still the most powerful today in in part because those choice lands are still paying dividends now as you would expect house dane of starfall might qualify as remote but they don't really reside in a desert like a lot of Dornish houses do. They're near the desert, but they're on an island that seems kind of non-deserty as far as we know. So I wouldn't call them extreme for the main branch of House Dane. But our first example, High Hermitage, well, let's look at it on a map. Does their cadet branch qualify? Let's see. It's hard to be sure, but let's lay out some factors and you can weigh in and decide on your own. The Torrentine is a nasty river. So it's, it surely provides fresh water and fish, but it does not provide access or transportation, which is a thing that a lot of rivers do. So it's not going to be useful for trade or moving people around, like act, just easy transportation, things like that. So that makes it a little more difficult to, to, to manage, makes it a little more harder to live at. And High Hermit is, looks like, if this accurate, if this location is 100% accurate, which it might not be, looks like it's fairly far away from the Torrentine. It's a little ways off. So that might mean it has poor access to water, but maybe it has a well or something up there. Not sure. Anyway, the name of the castle suggests it's at very high altitude, High Hermitage. And I mean, hermits tend to live far from society. That's the whole point of being a hermit, right? You're a, away from civilization. You live solo. So a hermitage is the place where a hermit lives. It sounds like it's extremely remote, very far away from civilization. Nina has a great theory about it, like a, a place of contemplation for or testing ground, even perhaps for those who would be sort of the morning or those who are sort of the morning, maybe even both. That you would, it's like you go there to meditate and reflect on whether you're truly worthy before returning to the main spot and saying, yes, I am or, or no, I'm not or something like that. Of course, this is pure headcanon, but it's really cool. And it's the kind of thing we get to fill in the blanks on when we have when we don't know better. So as a castle now, it isn't so. Oh, it's a cadet branch of House Dane. Darkstar lives there. He has ancestors that lived there. And he but he probably doesn't have like a large staff. He probably doesn't have a big household. He probably doesn't have a lot of soldiers that he can raise. Uh, so we'll have to call this one a temporary but strong maybe. And why temporary? Because we're probably going to see it in the winds of winter. Arya Hotas going there. He's got POVs, so we might see him. We might just hear about it afterwards to hear what happened. But I think we're going to see it. So we can maybe make a secondary judgment after that. What is that? How does that sound to you, Sean? What is that? How does that register? Does that sound hardcore? Or maybe it's just not enough information? Or how does that strike you? It's got the potential to be hardcore. I, I, one of my thoughts was that at least maybe, you know, before it was more settled in the castle and everything that maybe to get up there, you know, from climbing, sometimes it's easier to get up than back down. Like if you have That's to true. crest a, a ledge and make a leap, you know, 
coming back down, you can't do that backwards. So if you go up there, you're kind of stuck. You have to really <laughs> yeah. want to be a hermit to do it, you know? <laughs> That's a good point. And I wonder, maybe it's not even that high altitude. Maybe they just grow weed up there or something. <laughs> <laughs> Same as High Garden, right? Yeah. You just want to smoke in peace, go to High Hermitage. <laughs> no one, no one's going to know. No one's going to catch you if you're way the hell up there, right? <laughs> like, they'll never catch me up here. <laughs> I'm going to great lengths to conceal your weed smoking. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, there's a lot of other houses that are high high up that like that in the mountains the Dor dorn is full of houses that live high in the mountains and this is a small problem that we had in trying to figure this episode out is i'm not really sure which dornish houses are the most remote compared to others there's houses like house blackmont house manwoody things like that uh that are important houses that have their castles up in the mountains but we just don't have enough detail to judge just how far away they are from supplies and how many people they have some of them sound pretty hardcore i mean house blackmont sigil is a vulture carrying a baby like that's <laughs> damn and the house man what he's is a crown skull this is these aren't like friendly sigils <laughs> you know they they certainly project uh intimidation or a level of hardcore that might rise to what we're looking for today nina guesses house fowler is probably a good candidate for the highest uh, altitude wise because they're uh, it's described as a lofty perch with soaring stone towers their emblem is a hawk <laughs> their mm, yeah. motto is let me soar i mean that's pretty it's, it's definitely a candidate so they're they're up there but they're also pretty wealthy and powerful which doesn't maybe the more wealth and power you have the more you maybe get lax because you have so much and you don't push as hard and, and maybe you don't ride out in the desert as often as you might because you've got iced drinks <laughs> and, <laughs> and treats <laughs> sitting there at your castle somehow i doubt there's nice drinks and, and snacks at high hermitage but there might be at skyreach house like blackmont and manwoody hmm, i believe they're pretty powerful but that doesn't mean that they're uh they're throwing their money around it that they care about you know expensive comforts so yeah now what does this do to you physiologically since we wanted to make that a part of this episode what exactly are their hardcore qualities okay well there's living in a desert or a mountain which comes with certain heat resistance perhaps maybe a little bit more other things high altitude adapts your lungs to lower oxygen environments it can manifest in the body by just more lung tissue a lot of high altitude people just have more total lung tissue mass which absorbs more oxygen so it just or allows you to absorb more oxygen from air that has less oxygen in it and that reverse is true a major problem for a lowland army to go up altitude you imagine like all the soldiers are like oh, oh. none of them are acclimated to that like a week ago they were on like sea level and now they're marching up into the mountains you can see why dorn has resisted conquest so many times how it's so, so hard even for the other dornish to conquer each other uh, that's why dorn was the least united of the kingdoms for so long because they have a hard time defeating each other in their home territories like if you're like the dornish mountain houses aren't going to be all that acclimated to the desert necessarily and vice versa some of them might have both but Pretty different geography in Dorne, you know, from place to place where you're going. The coast to the mountain to the desert. A lot of different types of terrain and climate there. Even just the top of the mountain to the bottom or vice versa. Yeah. The Grand Canyon has a 40 degree difference between the top and the bottom. Whoa. So if you start at the top and it's 70 degrees and go to the bottom, it's freezing. It's freezing wow. cold at the bottom. Wow. And I didn't know that. I've been to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and if you start at the bottom and it's I've a, been a to the cool... Bottom. I if you start at the bottom and it's a cool 60 and you go to the top, it's a hundred. Yeah. Like, and so it's getting hotter as you go. You're like, do I want to go higher? Maybe we should go back down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so think about an army or just a group of soldiers, a squadron, 20 good men from a mountain house that's acclimated to high altitude. They're going to be able to keep moving longer. They're just able to, when they get into a high oxygen environment, that's going to pay off for them. They're going to be able to keep going more because their bodies are more adapted to low oxygen, give them high oxygen. And they're going to be like, raring to go their red blood cells are chock full of oxygen and more than it would be for you know a regular folk so 
that's a really big difference. And Sean, you point that out about the, the temperature difference. It's also just a big difference from day to night. Like in a desert, a lot of times just the temperature just drops massively because the way the sand absorbs heat during the day versus at night, there's nothing. So yeah, yeah. there's uh, it that has to do with the humidity in the air. There's not mm. uh, there's nothing to capture the heat. It just like the sand absorbs it during the day, but then it dissipates because there's no cloud cover. There's no moisture. Mm. So it just dissipates away at night. I, also, I just need to clarify. I said it backwards. It's it's hotter at the bottom than the top. If, so. Oh, when I saw the really? Grand Canyon. Sorry, I, I think I said those backwards when I said it. Interesting. You did say you it backwards. And it would make more sense to me to be the opposite because, you know, heat rises and, and whatnot and the sun reaches more. I, it just it makes sense to me that the bottom would be colder. Me so too. I didn't it's, check you on that. But you'll see other Yeah. yeah. Okay, oh. so the air is more compressed or just trapped down there as part of it, I huh. guess. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Just yeah, like in general, when you go to the top of mountains, it's colder. There's, there's oh, snow I guess, and ice. I guess that's true. At the top when it's yeah. That makes okay. okay. That, well, that part makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And there's there's an interesting thing that that the technology that's developed the, since ancient times, even like you see this in some Arabic cities, Persian cities, where they have what's called a wind catcher. It's like a tower that's open, and the wind comes in and flows downward. And it pushes the oh. hot air back out. So it's like That's ancient awesome. air conditioning. And it works really well. Like mm. the hottest city in the world. I forget the name of it. It's like uh, Al-Akra. I can't remember. I, don't quote me on the name. But it's Las like Vegas. 100. And, <laughs> it's like 117 <laughs> degrees like on the regular. But with these mm. wind they have. And they have they is have some modern east, technology there, of course. But they also use Ethiopia? these wind catchers. What's that? Is it Dalol in Ethiopia? That might be it. That's the record for highest average temperature for an inhabited place. Okay. Wow. That's that's hot as hell. And speaking of hell, our first more confirmed hardcore house, just like the name High Hermit is, is quite suggestive. So is Hell Holt, right? <laughs> H's are very strong letters, especially in Dorn. Arr, how I, yeah. So, ha, let's move on to Not the as strong as R. <laughs> yes <laughs> they don't call it muck duck <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not the ulex it's the ullers yeah so hell holtz and the uller let's have a quote here to get us started there are always a few who walk the roads that others shun seeking after fortunes in the bleaker corners of the world and so it was with the andals who made their way to dorne some contested with the first men who had come before them for the choice lands along the green blood and the coasts, or ventured into the mountains. Others established themselves in places where no man had gone before them. Amongst those were the Ullers and the Corgiles. The former raised a grim, stinking seat beside the sulfurous yellow waters of the brimstone, whilst the latter established themselves amidst the dunes and deep sands, fortifying the only well for five league for 50 leagues around. So Corgile is next. So that's part of why we had that double quote to talk about them both. And uh, as you'll see, as I read the quote on screen, I put this uh, video animation um, that I created, generated uh, of the Hell Holt using um, Adobe Firefly and Runway. And I thought it would be a nice visual um, accompaniment for some quotes when we talk about locations. So let me know if you like it. Yeah, I think it's awesome. You can see the sulfurous river there, the hell hole. We had to kind of imagine what it looks like. We don't have like a description, a strict description of what the castle looks like, but this looks fantastic. So if you're someone who listens to us on podcasts and every once in a while glances at the screen because we mentioned something up there, this is a good time to look. This looks really cool. The river, it looks like, you know, high end quality. This is the kind of thing that a studio would would probably charge thousands of dollars to make but Ashay did it all on her own we're using some cool software so i'm pleased with that and let's talk about it uh, a consideration regarding both Corgile and uller is that they are sandy dornishmen thus they have more roinar in them than most dornish so it's a really interesting melting pot of a culture you have andal fusing with roinar and the fact that many of the Andal noble houses formed by dominating mostly existing local populations. So you have the local population of Sandy Dornishmen that existed prior. You have these Andal nobility coming in with their blonde hair, blue eyes, or what have you. And then you have the Roinar who are dark haired, dark eyed, and dark skinned as well. So this three way combo that's pretty interesting, which should produce a lot of variety of people. Like it's very diverse within its a small re region of Dorn, although a lot of other Dorn is similar with a different percentages of mixtures there but still very diverse so like 
here are some things that I learned, like long, having a long face, low body fat, height, and wide noses are uh, common for desert people. Actually, the height, let me correct myself. Height, in humid climates, you have tall. In shorter climates, you have medium to shorter height. And the reason for that is very, very basic. If you are tall, you have more surface area on your body for sweating, which is how the only way the body has evolved to cool itself. Uh, of course, we have cultural ways of cooling ourselves, <laughs> ice, refrigerators, things like that. But those are not coming from within your body. Wide nostrils help keep your the air cooler in your nose when you're inhaling it, for example. I was going to say, other than sweating, that is one other mechanism for cooling a body is breathing through your nose. Okay. We're not particularly good at it. If you have a wider, bigger nose, you're a little better at it. But that's why if you think about long distance running animals, mm. horses, dogs tend to have longer snouts to oh, cool yeah. their body as they run. That the the, the breath sense. flowing, they have more blood vessels and that more surface area to cool. Sprinting short distance, you know, cats, short, shorter snouts. Right on. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, so an antelope will literally cook its own brain running away from a cheetah. If it if it doesn't, you know, if it just keeps running at that speed, whoa. it'll get so hot it cooks its own brain. That's so crazy. that's why they have longer snouts to and that's why it's up close to the brain because it cools it better. So anyway, yeah. Oh, wow, wow. That's amazing. And I mentioned earlier, dark skin being in a, a good adaptation for deserts. It's it's a protection from solar radiation. Like people with darker skin have more protection against solar radiation and they sweat less. They're like the th sweating threshold is lower. So we can assume people who have evolved there or were there long enough, which I'm not sure evolution could have taken place there because it's, it's when we're talking about 10,000 years. But the adaptations will be pretty strong. It's adaptations like dark skin, maybe wider noses, things like that. So this is one way you can kind of perceive these Dornish folks to look with the uh, caveat that there's also this Andal blood and Roinar blood mixed in and, and the time scale being too small for that to all become some new amalgam. Now, uh, so we have a lot of different fun things there. And again, but we get to throw in the magic, though. The Roinar blood is very possibly containing some blood magic. There was water magic, not blood magic, but water magic that may have an effect on them. Maybe maybe they need less water. Maybe they're pre-developed, adapt, adapted to needing less water. Maybe there's maybe their cells like purify the water inside their body somehow. <laughs> Something cool like that. I don't know. But these are it's lots of room for imagination here. And I, I think this is particularly fun for someone who's like doing role playing campaigns, like uh, having an understanding of small differences in physiology, uh, physiognomy, physiognomy, physiological traits. <laughs> oh, what do you know the word I'm trying to say? And also, I think it has a good real world uh, adaptation or application because it's just like it really just like explains these small differences that we have across cultures as just you're just adapting to your climate that's it we're really not that different in that like obviously cultures can be different and all that but you get down to it it's just the reasons we look different from each other worldwide are mostly overwhelmingly because of where we where our ancestors were born what climates they lived in it's, it's there's not it's really all there is to it you know for the most part so it really just so yeah we're all we're all very similar y'all anyway off my soapbox so they settled by a river, the Ullers. It's like, wait, a river? Why was why did it take so long for people to settle by this river? Why did no Roinar prior to this? Why did no first men settle by this river? That seems like an obvious place to build. Well, it's called the Brimstone. That gives you a clue as to why no one wanted to live there. And you saw All the rivers image. aren't created equal. Yeah, you saw the if you saw the image that Shea posted, that river was yellow because it's sulfurous. <laughs> There's lots of sulfur in that river. That's not the best. So harsh and rocky, not fit for anchorage. It flows into the sea, but the sea, but the hellhole is nowhere near the sea. And I don't know if boats can even traverse the, the brimstone to get out to the sea. I'm thinking no, because if they, if the living near the shore was an advantage, they probably would have done so. But yeah, there's nothing. So I don't think there's a lot of ships on the brimstone. There might be some, but they probably just river craft. If so, I doubt they're ocean going. And there's a deep desert in every direction too, except so like if you go south, you, it's deep desert until you get to the rocky coasts that are terrible and barren. West, it's even deeper desert. East, it's a lot of empty desert until you get to Vaith, uh, but there's a lot of sand dunes between the Hellholt and Vaith. 
And so, yeah, so deep desert in almost there. And north is the same story. Yeah, so the Ullers are just surrounded by desert and their water supply is sulfurous. Yeah, so the first men wanted, wanted nothing to do with the brimstone. <laughs> nothing at all. You can see on the map, look at that, the deep sands, the red dunes. When you see it that way, you're like, okay, I get why no one settled there for a long time. And you might have gotten why no one ever settled there if no one ever did. But these Ullers are, well, they're a little different. And that's why they're pretty hardcore. So think about this, though. You think about where this first Andal Lord, this, this Uller came from, the first guy. Well, remember, they didn't cross the land bridge. The land bridge was gone by the time the Andals came. The Andals started up in Andalos, which is northwestern Essos. It's close to like Bravos. <laughs> so the opposite end, basically. So this guy came all the way from there and then went all the way to Dorne and into the deep deserts. Like, here's where I'm building a castle. <laughs> like that, that guy had a long journey. He you could have a really cool story behind all that, like how he even learned of the existence of the spot. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go build a house out in the desert. Maybe he really liked hot weather. <laughs> Who knows? But a very maybe determined. He didn't, maybe he didn't really even like that spot. He was just too tired to keep looking for another spot. Like, <laughs> He's like, the yellow this river. Is it, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's a while. Like thousands of years of Andals coming over and it still was took this long for someone to finally say okay i'm gonna build here but 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 i get it i mean this is a very hardcore guy who started this all off and he was hardcore enough to survive apparently because his descendants they didn't say nah what was our founder thinking they were like yeah let's keep it going y'all it's, it's it's fine you know so there was another family in the general vicinity at some point we don't know if it was before or after but there was a guy called king lucifer dryland lord of hellgate hall and he was one of the native Dornish kings sent to the wall by Nymeria during her conquest. So they may have been there already, just farther north, but not on the brimstone. You can see the ruins there. Uh, I guess it is on the brimstone, maybe at the headwaters there. It's a little, yeah, maybe right when it opens up. So maybe they were up in the mountains of where the hell, where the, the river, er, the brimstone emanates. But this is very speculative at this point. So that person's gone. That house is gone now. Who, what was that name again? Lord Lucifer? Dry land. Lord <laughs> of the Hell Holt or something? No, Lord of Hellgate Hall. So another hell word. We got a Hell Holt and the Hellgate Hall. So this, this land is very hellish, clearly. I'm saying it sounds like that name was one of our patron names. It sounds like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Lucifer Dry. laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean true. I mean, you come across a yellow sulfurous river and tell me you don't just decide, like, okay, we're embracing the hellish nature of the landscape. Like, I think <laughs> it's all based on the brimstone. Yeah, I mean, this dude was named Lucifer, too. I mean, George really leaned into the hell <laughs> yeah, think, stuff here. Yeah, I think it's more so George <laughs> leaning into it than the Dornish necessarily. Like, I think George was kind of doing that. <laughs> yeah, so dry land really tells you a lot, too. Like, that's that's not, that's like a Stark name where it just tells you exactly what it is. Like, forester you know <laughs> <laughs> so that that's that's pretty straightforward i think so maybe they had uh well they definitely had another name first it wasn't called the hellhold at first it got renamed we don't know what the original name was there was like an orange wedding of sorts and the egg hole the egg because it smells like egg when it's sulfur does. dust you know They're and, like, mm. and egg had a similar ending egg, you know because he burned to death at summer hall oh, gosh. which is what happened here <laughs> to give this castle that what the orange egg. wedding is talking about i don't know this story. yes he locked a but yes i'm glad you asked sean yeah so a bunch of the the, the lord of the not yet called hell holt lord uller invited a bunch of local lords to come have dinner at his hall whereupon he locked them all in it and burned it <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, right. So then it got the name the Hell Holt. So yeah, Orange Wedding because flames, right? Yeah, you know, the Ash Wedding, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Yeah, uh, that's a hardcore name, hardcore way to earn it. Maybe not hardcore so much as murderous, but it's still, you know, it fits. You think maybe the twins will get renamed after this, since the Red Wedding <laughs> happened? Like it's no longer we don't call it the twins anymore. It's the the Murder Bridge. <laughs> 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 yeah and this would not be the only time the hell hole was burned i mean it's got it it's, it's with a name like that it just just it spontaneously catches fire every 50 no i'm just kidding it's, <laughs> it doesn't do that but it is probably the only time the elders did it themselves the other times that it got burnt which are not stories that are off uh not for us to tell today but yeah it's a castle that's been burned more than once so anyway we don't know their house words 
but a common phrase about them is half the others are half mad and the others are worse. <laughs> Nina uh, suggested tempered by fire. Nina loves to come up with house words for mm -hmm. houses that don't have them. I like that one a lot. It fits. It's it, it, it's very well. It's it is very fitting. It, it's like perfectly fitting, really. I was thinking it might be. Ah, I'm on fire. Ah. <laughs> Maybe that's their house words. Word. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Quentin, whatever. Yeah. Quentin ours, I was thinking it could be ours is the stink. Ours is the stink. <laughs> yeah, probably all is... smell like the sulfur river. <laughs> <laughs> eggs, <laughs> bird, yeah, eggs and uh, eggs and fire. <laughs> Not blood and fire, eggs and fire. Yeah. <laughs> so do they have some sort of gene that keeps getting passed down that makes them half mad? Is it like something they actually select unnaturally select for? Like we want the mad ones to be <laughs> those ones that that are in charge, like some strange reverse situ situation here, or, or is it the sulfur? Is it the sulfur in the water that's messing with them? Because they've adapted to it. Clearly, they can drink it on some level or at least use it. But when the a Tyrell army was there or Reach army was there, they got sick. Not from the water, because they weren't going to drink that. They're like, no, we know better than to drink that. But from the fish they got out of it, that made them sick. So talk about an adaptation. It's not for visitors. This is not a touristy <laughs> type of thing. You're like, yeah, eat the local food. No, do not eat the local. Bring your own food. Stay as short of time as you can. I mean, remember the quote I just read. It's grim and stinking, which is, yeah, the sulfur does that. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, like you have like this reputation, Nina points out, you'd have to be a crazy to live in a place like that. And then that enhances the notion that they're crazy people. But it isn't quite that simple. We know that there's I'm sure there's been some some sweet, soft others over the years. Maybe not a lot of them, but <laughs> and given that they're a noble house, you could survive like if you're born sweet and soft living out in the desert. That's probably not going to work out so well. But if you're a noble house, that has a little bit of you have a little bit of privilege backing you up then. You, you know, you might be able to get away with it. So yeah, rotten eggs is a common comparison to sulfur, the smell. Yeah, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have been to some sulfur hot springs, which also raises the question, if they have a sulfur river, do they have a hot springs by them Ooh. as well? Because um, that is kind of common. I, I, don't know if, I don't know if all sulfurous bodies of water have hot springs. But in California, I used to go to um, Warner Hot Springs, which is the sulfur hot spring. And so I associate that smell with like relaxation Ooh. and like good time. I, I smell the rotten egg sulfur smell. And it just is a good association for right me. <laughs> so when they say grim and stinking, I'm like, I don't know. They might have a hot spring. <laughs> <laughs> in the night, which you might be like, oh, well, it's desert. Who cares? Well, we just talked about how cold it gets at night. Those the hot, hot spring at nice. night could be quite nice, actually. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. The winter, the, the hot springs at Winterfell also maybe have some of that, that smell. But yeah, they no might talked stink about a little. it being stinking they're like oh this brings us life and, the, and it's cold yeah they pipe it through the walls you know yeah maybe they, yeah and that's a great point like turning a weakness into a strength is, is the next part i wanted to bring up here which is that maybe quite possibly the others have found a way to to make good on this sulfur sulfur is a valuable uh material it's, it's a valuable substance it's used in medicine even now. It's not just an ancient medicine, although it's used less than it was because it's it's, it's not a cure all. It was used more often in ancient times, but it's still used now quite a bit. And it's a fertilizer, which might explain part of how they're able to survive there. They're able to like take some crappy land, use the proper amount of sulfur on it, and it might produce some some crops or something like that. And they might be able to harvest it and sell it, sell sulfur. Like they, they might be sulfur traders. That might be what this Andal guy was thinking. He's like, you know what? Eh, sulfur is pretty useful. We could make a profit off of that. That might have been his angle in the first place or part of it. I doubt it was the whole picture, but it, it may have been like, that's another pro and we can sell sulfur. <laughs> Maybe he was a blood magician and needed sulfur for his spells. Ooh, yeah, it's possible. Mm -hmm. You never know. So as Nina was saying, not all not all Ullers are violent or half mad. Ilaria Sand. Now, if you're thinking of TV show Ilaria Sand, then that's just she's just another one in the column of ultra violent, vin vindictive. But book version Ilaria is the exact opposite of that. She is an open advocate for ending the cycles of revenge, not just despite the death of her lover Oberyn, but because of it. In part because of it. She's like, look, this is what happens. Even him, even the Red Viper, an incredible warrior, an incredible man, an inc a talented guy, even he ends up dead because of these cycles of revenge, right? And she's like, I don't want my family, my daughters, his children to be caught up in that. 
her daughter Elia is in the Arian T Wow chapters, and she takes more after her father. So <laughs> we've got another older blooded person that's uh, mm -hmm. taking the stage here. So yeah, Elia might be half mad. She's very she is a little uh uh seems unwise to danger <laughs> given what we see in her sh of her in that short time. Arianne planned to crown Marcella at the Hellholt, not just because of her family connections and Oberyn's death, but because of how difficult it would be for anyone to assault the Hellholt. Like who's going to bring an army there? That's that's something you got to think twice about. To think it could have been the Marcel Holt, but no. <laughs> not so but even arianne decided actually maybe that's not a good idea the elders might be too dangerous <laughs> so there you go that's pretty hardcore so all this reminds us they're a fairly major house despite their terrible location they've still managed to become very powerful and they're going to come up in fire and blood when we get back to that as well and of course in the song of ice and fire so their choice of home in a different light could have been a mark in their favor something that marks them as tough it's like hey it must be a tough, it must be hard to survive out there. Instead, it marks them as unnatural. It's like, you, know, you got to be crazy to live there. They don't, it's not a mark of respect after all. It's like, oh, they're just crazy weirdos, you know? And, uh, but that's in world, not my opinion. <laughs> I think they're hardcore. Sean, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah. I, I also got kind of like you were saying, it's, it's turning a weakness into strength. It's who wants to conquer them? Right. Like, yeah, if you have to be crazy to live there, or if it stinks really bad, they're a little bit safer from invasion or whatever. So good point. Good point. So, Shay, what do you think? Pretty hardcore, huh? The hardest, of course. The hardest, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good point, because for the rest of this episode, as we go through more houses, which we have less detail on this one, we took spent the most time on. But that was sort of by design because they're the bar. Can anyone else live up to this? Can anyone match House Uller for hardcoreosity? Can they, anyone else be harder than than the hardcore that they are? We'll see. I think some will get close. One or two might even be able to match them. One or two might be able to pass them. But we'll see. That'll be up to you. <laughs> more <laughs> more months <laughs> is a possibility, and they are in this episode. So, and but you got to keep in mind when we're judging them that because we have more info on the Ullers, that might be part of why we see them as more hardcore. Like if we knew more about some of these other houses, we might say, oh, actually, that that does put them on even footing. But it is a matter of opinion. Ultimately, it does. There's no scoring system we have here. So it's up to y'all. You let us know. We're very open to comments on this one, even more than usual. Philip Plus says, sends a super chat and says, who would you be more scared to make an enemy of? House Uller or House Bolton? Oof. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Like, depends on where I live. I'd, I wouldn't want to. I think House Bolton's reach is farther. But. And I would definitely less rather be caught by them. Their method of doing harm is far more intimidating. But like they aren't like a super group of tough guys. You know what I mean? Like they're dangerous because of their cultural attitudes, but they're not like known for their like the, the Boltons don't stand out as particularly tough in winter versus the rest of the North or anything like that. At least not the ones we've seen. Yeah, just because they do mean things to their prisoners doesn't mean they are tough, right? Yeah. It they would be scared of getting flayed also. <laughs> right. Like I would think a Uller would handle torture better than a Bolton. If it's, if, if it's yeah. turned around on them. Yeah. Like I think an, I think an Uller would survive longer in the desert without supplies than a Bolton would in, in the cold. Maybe, maybe not. That's still just a guess. Like this is where we know very few Boltons. <laughs> like we know like one and a half or one and two halves. We know Ramsey's a half Bolton and we know we, we know a little bit about Domerick, but we, we don't even have a, we hardly have any, women boltons for example there are some like historically but we know so little about them so yeah it's interesting we know more about house bolton but we know more about the people of house uller i think which is kind of an interesting quirk of this of this analysis here all right moving on to the next one house corgile house of, of castle sandstone they're a decent comp here because they live so close by so they have a lot of the same factors more art on screen here look at the three scorpions which are the sigil of House Corgile, three black scorpions on a field there. So if the Ullers can claim to be hardcore for living in the deep deserts of Dorne, a fair claim, of course, far from the sea or other major settlements with only a tainted water supply for a river, well, then the Corgiles can arguably go one further. They have no river at all tainted or otherwise and are even farther west than the Hellhole while being even farther from the sea and other houses. So they're definitely more remote, I'd say. That, but that by itself doesn't make them more hardcore. And apparently they have plenty of scorpions. Those scorpions aren't just a affectation for fun. 
Dorn is known for its scorpions and is a reminder of something that probably bothers the Ullers as well and a lot of other Dornish is that some of the local fauna is quite deadly. Scorpions, scorpions like this are killer. They're dead. They are. They will. This their venom alone can mess you up pretty bad if not kill you. Like the Ullers, the Corgiles were Andal founded. They they as that quote said that Shea read a little while back. They found a well in the deep desert. And then fortified it. They're like, oh, there's the only well for 50 leagues. It's ours. This is very like Dune, like where the water is tightly locked down. And because the water is locked down by one house, they have probably outsized authority over the over the region as compared to most lords do over their region. Like control of the water, like that's the most life-giving, most vital thing there is. And if you're the only one with with water with water supply, you really do. To basically decide who lives and who dies. So I think this is maybe an unnoticed factor of House Corgile. Um, and yeah, uh, so I think they're more probably more authoritative than most, which doesn't necessarily make them more hardcore, but it does make them fearsome. If you're in a region that has a big lake or a river or it rains all the time, we well, can't control the water. But if you're in the middle yeah. of the desert and there's a well and you control it, yeah, that's a that's power. A that's more powerful than gold. Yeah. yeah. So, and there are things that this would also apply to the Ullers and a lot of other Dornish, including the people of High Hermitage, these other mountain houses that we're not sure about, such as we mentioned high altitude, but there's also things like the adaptation to thirst. There's a solid body of evidence that a component to thirst is psychological, aka it's called anticipatory thirst. It's really interesting. It's like, because water is so important to our survival, deep in our subconscious and in our higher brain functions, like way up in our higher brain functions, we're thinking about where our next drink is coming from. So if you're a desert person, you know where the wells are, you know where your friends are, you know, you've got, you don't have water anxiety. A, you're more adapted. B, you know where the sources are. But if you're an army marching into a hostile territory where you don't know the water is, you might have water in your canteen right now, but you're thinking ahead to next week already. That's a major thing. And it makes you more thirsty right then. So you go through your water faster because of this water anxiety. And think about this on the scale of an entire army. Like they're just not going to have enough water. And the tr the leader, the general, the army leading this, like a Tyrell or a Hightower or somebody, they don't know this. <laughs> they're just like all bravado. They're like, we're going to fight the Dornish, you know, our ancient enemies. Mm -hmm. We're proud and brave, and they're not thinking about thirst, but they should be. They really should be, because it's the biggest weapon they're going to face. It's the biggest enemy that, that's facing them. The Dornish aren't their bigger, isn't the bigger foe than the sun, <laughs> as as Daron the First wrote in his Conquest of Dorn book. So, yeah, like a Reachman army disappeared between the Hellholt and the Vaith once. But uh, as I just said, the sands between the Hellholt and sandstone are even deeper <laughs> and and sparser. So, hmm, yeah. So these these houses that live in the deep sands, they would be acclimated to this. They would be better at managing thirst. They wouldn't be as anxious about where their next drink is coming from. And so that gives them a huge home field advantage. It allows them to travel farther and faster, especially if you combine that at, at that altitude stuff. Like they can handle, they can run farther and faster because they need less oxygen. And they don't need as much drink, much water. They're like camel. They're like camel people. <laughs> Which, by the way, camels don't exist in Dorne, but they do exist in the world. Uh, they, they exist in like Karth and, and Easter. What's a, that? What's a camel centaur? Whoa. Camtar? Camtar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yes, Camtar. You know, by the way, there, there are horses we'd be better adapted to. They are. And that's an explicit yeah. part of the world building. The Dorne sand steeds are the best horses in Westeros. Like remember dunk was given one he was like no this is too nice for me <laughs> he was yeah, offering he's yeah. like no I, this is no this is too fancy no i like my like this is more my style here like that horse is like oh someone's gonna steal that from me or something like <laughs> uh, yeah it's like walk it's like a hedge knight walking around with a crown like it just doesn't look right <laughs> you know <laughs> like a dude who a dude who has a minimum wage job driving a ferrari it just doesn't seem right you know like he's like yeah i can't even pay the up i can't even pay for the repairs on this thing you know <laughs> insurance so, yeah the insurance yeah forget about it right <laughs> so deserts obviously we talk about the heat and the cold there and like just some basic ideas of how hot and cold it can get since it's even probably an even bigger deal for for the corgiles in the sahara desert which is not the exact 
parallel here, but it's it's it gives us an idea. It can go all the way up to like 120 Fahrenheit in the summer, which is 49 Celsius, down to like zero Fahrenheit, negative 18 Celsius in the winter. So this gives you an idea of how dramatic the spread is. Now, Westeros is funny because its seasons aren't every three months, but it still should give us a guideline um, of what it basically is like about how hot it is, what temperatures they're acclimating to, what temperatures like an invader would have to deal with. Even when you have regular seasons, you can still get a variation. You know, Atlanta or Denver in the summer can be 110 or 40. You know, the the coolest part of night at the coolest part of summer can still be pretty cool. And that's a 50 degree temperature range. So Dorn yeah, can yeah. have that too, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whatever the seasons may be. So it's difficult to build, build a castle in, in an environment like this, but it's been done like in the real world. Think about like Machu Picchu and the pyramids and stonehenge and these things that were built like they're not a castle stonehenge isn't a castle but like the pyramids like it feels like they could have there's tunnels and <laughs> inside and it's way bigger than most castles so it doesn't seem beyond them at least in some way at least most aspects of it uh but a sixth of all humans on planet earth live in a desert so yeah it's just not that uncommon after all right i know technology of course helps a lot with that now like it, you probably one sixth of humans didn't live in the desert a thousand years ago but maybe they did. I don't know. I didn't. That's that. I didn't look up and I'm not sure how I would find it. It's worth noting. A desert is defined by, uh, you know, rainfall. And yeah, so there's true. a rain. Every desert isn't just barren sand dunes to the that's horizon true. like the Sahara, Sahara. So like New Mexico is a desert, but it doesn't, you know, there's not like sand dunes everywhere. It's just like kind of sparse, yeah. kind of red. It looks nice, you know, like there's Arizona. Trees similar. and flowers and cactus, yeah. you know, you don't get as much grass or, you know, it's maybe more limited vegetation, but not no vegetation. So one thing in the conquest that's coming that we haven't gotten to in Valaridis is how the Dornish just get to just run away. And this is part of because they're desert people. This is a real life thing. Desert folk tend to be nomadic. Desert folk tend to bring their livestock with them. This is how the Dornish were able to e easily pick up and move because it's already sort of part of their culture. They're already more mobile in the first place. Another important adaptation for desert folk, maybe this is too deep in the weeds, but I can't help myself, lactase persistence, which is the ability to digest milk as an adult. All kids, for the most part, not all, but almost all kids start off with the ability to digest milk, like you, you're taking mother's milk in. But but the genes for that, the the our ability to do that w falls off when we're like six or seven years old, unless you have this gene. There's huge variations of the lactase gene in the real world right now because it's fairly new uh, evolutionarily speaking, it's only a few hundred years old. Um, actually, that's not true. It's more like ten to five thousand years old. Uh, but it's that's still pretty small for <laughs> evolution. We're talking millions of years, right? Greek, for example, the Greek population is only has about seventeen percent uh, lactase persistence, whereas Irish, a hundred percent. <laughs> like uh, pretty much every Irish person has lactase persistence. They live around cattle. There's mm. lots of, they have like Ireland has some of the best dairy products in the world. Like having been there, I can attest to that. It's so good. But Greeks, Greece, they don't deal in cattle nearly as much. They deal more in like sheep and goats and, and other things. So it just wouldn't have developed there. So it's still very much a, a thing happening in our real world right now. So you would think that the Dornish that drink more milk than a lot of other places. The Dothraki drink milk, mare's milk. They're very adapted to it because it's part of their culture. But, uh, you know, if you find like a lot of probably other Westerosi, probably not that, probably have trouble with it. They lack taste. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> good one, good one. So, and desert folk tend to be better at operating at night. Now, it isn't necessary that their eyes are better, but their eyes are more trained because they operate at night because it's so hot during the day. <laughs> You're like, well, let's sleep during the hottest time of the day when it's like impossible to go out and get anything done. So they're just more practiced at doing things at night. So it's just more comfortable operating at night. And uh, we don't know what the hellhole or the sandstone are made out of, but mud, brick, stone, more of the mud and the brick probably than stone, but, but probably not the hellhole or the sandstone. Like probably more of the local structures are made of mud and brick, but... Hellholt and Sandstone themselves probably aren't mud castles. They're probably made of, or brick even, they're probably stone, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. They're made out of sulfur and blood. <laughs> Eggs. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that was my big question too. Yeah, when I was making it, I was like, what kind of what kind of material, what color should these uh, buildings be? Yeah, like, see, we'd have to have a little more knowledge about what kind of rocks. Like, I know there's a lot of, like, like I looked up the, the, the 
the world wonder modern world wonder Petra, which is a really f- amazing carved city with this beautiful front that's in a ravine and it's been there forever and people have lived in the area since like 7000 BC. So like yeah, whatever the local stone is is probably the most likely yeah thing. yeah i mean i guess we hear i mean we hear about red sands and i guess it would be more yellow stones and yeah there yeah so th- this is yeah this is something that um seems pretty likely that they didn't like like a lot like some very few castles like the veil vale, where they brought marble in from a whole other region because they didn't like the local marble like th- they didn't have that kind of cash at the hall for <laughs> founding their castle i don't think and i also wonder what kind of materials <laughs> would have would be best for the 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 climate what well, keeps know. it cooler maybe if there's anything like that like yeah. absorbing or deflecting sunlight yeah that's a good point yeah if they had choices they might have gone with that if they they may not have had a lot of choice like well whatever the local strong stone is we just have to use that uh so this as you might have guessed or thought about or knew already this is the location of the famous scorpion from the ceiling incident the scorpion house with the scorpion from the ceiling it all fits right they wanted to do something that rang throughout the ages and it would match up with their sigil to make it even more memorable. And so it was. Now, earlier we mentioned how growing up in a tough climate makes you tough, even if it's a different kind of toughness than other climates. Like, uh, for example, who is the Lord Commander at the start of the books? Gior Mormont. The Mormonts are on our list today. The Mormonts are tough, and he comes from that region, basically, the, the north, where it's cold. He was very adapted to that climate already. But the Lord Commander before Mormont was a Corgile. We don't know if he was the Lord of Sandstone. He was just a Corgile. We have no idea if he was, you know, how high ranking he was, but he was from that house. And he died about 10 years before Song of Ice and Fire began. So not that long ago. Yeah, so he rose to the top in an environment, in a region, in a place that requires toughness. The Night's Watch, like toughness plays there. And he he rose to the top just like Gior Mormont did. So that's very telling. You got people that come from tough home environments that you put them in a, in a place where there's a lot of people that are in a tough spot. And they rise to the top of that because they're among the toughest. Tells you a lot about Sandstone. Tells you a lot about these Corgiles. Oberyn Martell, fostered at Sandstone. He's got connections to this two of these toughest houses, <laughs> a wife and kid, uh, one of his lovers and several of his children are, are Uller, and he himself was fostered at the San- at Sandstone. So, yeah. What do you think uh, on this one, Sean? Just as hardcore as the Ullers or maybe a little less or even a little more, maybe? I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, huh? Wait, which one are you comparing to the Ullers? Uller to, Uller to Corgile, yeah. The Corgal, yeah. I'm gonna say I think the sulfur puts him over the top. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the fiery history. <laughs> yeah, they got more of the vibe, even if it's some of it's just marketing, you know. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> they definitely it's, it's, it counts. Like reputation matters, you know. What do you think, Ashea? How does Corgal stack up for you versus Uller? I would rather live where the Ullers live. Okay. So if that makes them less hardcore, I don't. I don't know. Kind of does. But yeah. like, I maybe it makes me more hardcore. Oh, okay. That's another way to look, look at it. it yeah. Like that, I'm not sure. You're just saying it because you think there's a spring there. That is why I'm <laughs> saying it. And I like. I, I mean, even if there's no spring, I think I would enjoy the the swell. I'm sorry to sound like a freak. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got a lot more to come. Let's take a short break. Amanda Molino sends a super chat, says, I have to send some thanks because I learned so much from this podcast that is not Westeros related. Well, we thank you for that. I, I do try to do, I, I don't, I hesitate to call it research because it's really just looking things up. I think research is, is generally kind of that term is thrown around a little too much. Research is, is a little more involved than just looking some things up, but I do try to be accurate. I do try to like bring in real world stuff. And I think that does give a little, I think that well, adds a little something. I enjoy doing that. I, I'm glad to hear that you all, at least some of you all do. It wasn't research. It was first search. <laughs> you know, you weren't, you weren't searching right again. <laughs> Several comments on the Neanderthal stuff here and some other things. Lauren Quigley says we beat Neanderthals due to their group size. We think they were better adapted at cold weather with their stocky bodies and big noses and had bigger brains than humans. Human groups were bigger and more chances to communicate, breed and have ideas. Yeah. Like I said, there's competing theories and that doesn't mean that. And of course it isn't necessarily only one of these can be right. It can be some of both. Uh, so, and yeah, like I said, most of what I got is just from reading pretty basic scholarly articles or just Wikipedia. So I'm definitely not going to be like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> Cause I, I have no basis for certainty here. Uh, so I think we should take all these things and, and keep them in our minds as, as possible or likely, or just in the discussion. E- 
one thing if you did do deeper research that you would find is they keep coming up with new discoveries that make them have to reevaluate what they thought. There's mm, just yeah. so much more data available now than it was even 10 years ago. So. Guilty Undertaker, two great takes here. One, just to point out that about 5% of modern human DNA is from Neanderthals. And that really de depends on who you are. Like there's some groups that are like in the lower, like less than 1% where some have a little more than that. But yeah, we definitely, it's de definitely still out there, which is interesting. It's, it lingers that long. And Guilty Undertaker also says, even in the fairly wet reach, control of water is important, as we saw in the Sworn Sword. A great point. I'm surprised I didn't think of that. Because, yeah, that was all about water rights and fires starting because there's not enough water and just crops failing for that reason and, and how they have to be tough when they're when it's a matter of land and they have to, you know, be kind of not compromising because that's just the way things are. And yeah. Good yeah, call. Drought, even, you know, it's not necessarily a dry region region where it's normally a concern, but when it does become a concern, when it does become a concern, you get a shuffling of power. You, mm. You've got to reevaluate, you know, uh, th that that's an, an edge. People who have control over water gain when that time of drought comes. And once a drought passes, that shift in power has already happened, you know, has a lasting effect. Good said. Good said. Also, once you give a shout out to the show that first inspired me to podcast and is very much included in the title of this episode, Hardcore History. That's a long running, very successful history podcast that's existed since the aughts, 2000 aughts, which is very few podcasts existed back then. Dan Carlin is a great podcaster. He stays enthusiastic during multi-hour podcasts, which is something that really inspired me. I'm like, yeah, if you can, you can like, he's still into it. He's talking about something that he's into. Me too. Like I love talking about Westeros and the Song of Ice and Fire history and, and current times. And so it's easy to be enthusiastic in some ways. So that's part of why I like choosing your enthusiasm. If you're going to be a podcaster, choose something that you're enthusiastic about. So you don't have to force the enthusiasm. Just, just have it. And he, he's also just, inspired me to think differently about education like enthusiasm really sells things like if you want people to, to listen to you be enthusiastic like that's it's a social connectivity when you're enthusiastic it's a positive thing and other people kind of want to listen i want to listen to the enthusiastic guy or at least for a minute maybe he's talking about something i don't care about but it, i'm more interested in that than i hear someone in like bemoaning tones or complaining or just like they don't sound very excited it's, it isn't necessarily they don't have lots of information quite possibly they have great information great things to say but let's be honest presentation matters bueller, bueller <laughs> classic example. anyone <laughs> good one good one yes so i, I most of y'all probably already know about hardcore history because it's vastly more popular than this show <laughs> but <laughs> if you haven't i do recommend it it is uh the biggest inspiration for for me uh, a lot some people have noted that my style is a little bit like dan carlin's which makes sense because I've had listened to him for dozens and dozens of hours before I ever heard a second podcaster. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just how it went. And if you want to support our show here, History of Westeros, and be get access to our bonus episodes and things like that, this is a good time to sign up to be a part of our Patreon because we're going to be in the next few months doing a lot of episode voting. We're gonna we have Valar Reedus for the Worlds of Ice and Fire or for Fire and Blood, but we're also gonna have uh, a whole host of episodes that we get voted on because we're trying to work a lot farther ahead on our schedule. We're usually just a few weeks out on our schedule, but we're trying to get much farther ahead on that. We're going to try to get months ahead on our schedule so that we can prepare more, have more graphics, have more time to ask for feedback ahead of time from y'all. We're taking another step. We're trying, we're always trying to improve our podcast and this is one of those things. So, uh, and we can only do that with y'all's support. And yeah, I think it's real fun to get to vote on the topics. I mean, you get to actually make a difference in what kind of content we create more than anything. So I don't know. I think it's a pretty great benefit from being on Patreon. Yeah. And yeah. it's one that we haven't had as much of in the last six months to a year as we focused on this part of Valerie Reedus for Fire and Blood. But I think some of you really liked the voting. I agree. Yeah, it does have, it has been a lot of fun to see y'all's takes. Like I'm often surprised at what gets voted in. Sometimes it's, I'm like, oh, that's sometimes last place is the one I thought would win. Like, I really don't know what to predict sometimes. I think I have a handle on this and I'm like, no, y'all keep surprising me. Sometimes it goes pretty much what I thought, but often it doesn't. So, <laughs> all right, let's get back to it. Now, one pattern you might notice 
we've only covered Dorne so far, but we're not covering all the regions because not all the regions have houses that we would consider hardcore based on our definition of hardcore. And that makes sense because it just there just is an extreme climate <laughs> and remoteness in the center of the continent, right? The Riverlands, it's not remote anywhere. Maybe the Isle of Faces can be considered remote, but there's no house there that we know of. High Heart is pretty mystical. It's a little bit out there, but it's not real. I wouldn't call it remote. It's got cool things like magical, mystical elements. It's hugely important for the story because so many chapters take place there. But the geography isn't extreme by any means. There's, it doesn't have the coldest climates, probably one of the warmer climates. And yeah, like there's some houses that are kind of hardcore. Like I'll give Seaguard an honorable mention because of the human element. They were built literally to defend against the Ironborn, which is pretty hardcore. Like your job is to fight Ironborn. You're going to be tough if that's your job, like, or you won't be around very long to do it. But they don't get any points for climate or isolation. So honorable mention, but maybe not quite hardcore. You might argue that fighting the Ironborn trumps all those other things, <laughs> but still it doesn't fit our specific definition today. Same goes for the Westerlands. It has some remote locations given the preponderance of mountains, but there's lots of them. So they can't be that far from each other. They're, they're not that remote and they're not that cold compared to some of the other mountainous regions. And they have a lot of resources. The, the Western mountains are gold and silver rich. Like Rob goes up into Ashmark, which is pretty semi-mountainous, but he still takes his whole army there, which he wouldn't have done that in Dorne. He wouldn't have just gone all over the place in Dorne. So we know it's, we know it's just easier to get around. To be fair, most armies aren't led by a warg. <laughs> Grey Wind was like <laughs> one of, is a level up if not three levels up in terms of like how you can move an army around because his ability to sniff out tracks and find ways that aren't there. That's there's a it's it, comparing things to Rob's army is maybe not fair, but still gray wind isn't going to be that much help in a desert. In fact, gray wind would be miserable in a desert. <laughs> so <laughs> we can still say that. Nina also mentions a possible honorable mention to house Lefford of the golden tooth. Perwin Frey describes it as a hard, strong keep. While it's not completely isolated, it is like on a border and it is high up in the mountains and it seems to be very geared towards fortress and less towards, you know, livable. So that would tend to make it more hardcore in that sense. My other honorable mention is the Bane Fort, which is hardcore for two reasons, one of which isn't really on our main list, the other being that they are proximal to the Ironborn, very close. They're like on the corner where the West bends around there it's uh it's right there so they're the, probably the closest house to the iron islands in the west and they're in the mountains a bit and their founder was like a necromancer or something that's what the, the tales are told that way the hooded man is was was an old school necromancer and that's pretty hardcore i guess if but i don't know if there's what values they have maintained from their founding necromancer <laughs> some however long ago that was like eight thousand years so uh, that may be more like hardcore in their history rather than now. But still, I wanted to throw them out there because that's pretty cool. You know, another potential honorable mention, I was thinking of, uh, you're talking about the Riverlands. I was thinking about House Reed being kind of in the swamps. That's, yeah. you know, I, maybe I have them in the north. on resources, but they're pretty remote. And it might deal with some tough creatures and disease, mosquitoes, alligators or whatever. So yeah. they're on the list. They're just part of the north. So you're right to think of them. Yeah, we will. But but I was thinking there might be other. They're kind of on the cusp, or there might be you're other right. swamp living Riverland houses. Uh, That's a good point because because the right you're right. The twins are like right there, and they're the ones that are always like talking about the 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 bug, the mud men, and how they're just right there next to them. So you're right. There's like a border in between there. There, there would be some people that kind of deal with both or have connections to both. Talking about the reach. Like, talk about a rich region. It's It doesn't work very well for hardcore at all. The most remote place is, like, the Arbor. And the Arbor is super rich and nice and sunny and full of all the wine. Like, we wouldn't call that hardcore. We call that a vacation spot. That's, like, one of the softcore. It's like, so if we were making softcore houses, they would be on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you might call Alaska or parts of Alaska hardcore, but you wouldn't call Hawaii hardcore, I don't think. That's the vacation spot, right? Probably <laughs> not. Yeah, probably not. Maybe some parts of it. Like, if you're living on one of the, like, the, low, like the islands where there aren't a lot of people, maybe. Yeah, that. or if you were living, like, up on Mount Akea or, like, up on like, like, a volcano. volcano. Yeah, yeah, I would say there are maybe hardcore spots. I still think they're relatively less hardcore than, than yeah. even any of these, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. So, and the reach, you get like, like the Riverlands, there's lots of obscure and interesting and mystical places, which we'll have time to discuss at a later date. But hardcore? Eh, probably not. Stormlands. Stormlands are almost like the West and the Reach and the Riverlands in terms of climate, and they're not that remote. But there is some hardcore weather conditions here that they don't have nearly as much of, and that's storms. It's also more humid, and we and anyone who's lived in wet climate versus dry climate knows that wet is worse in terms of like human endeavors, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute if, if you're not already familiar. Estremont, for example, it's an island, and a lot of the most hardcore houses live on islands because they're separate. They're, they're, they already have a bit of that remote baked in when they're on an island away from the mainland. Being a house on an island in the narrow sea also subjects you to raiders, pirates, slavers, and, and of course, being any, anywhere in the southern stormland subjects you to raids from Dornishmen, less so the other way. And definitely not so for Uller and, and Corgyle. They're not getting raided by the Stormlands way down in the desert. Northern Dornish houses are another matter, but even they are less susceptible because it's much easier to come out of Dorne into the Stormlands and attack it than it is to go into Dorne and attack it because Dorne is just so difficult. Whoever lived where Storm's End is before Storm's End was there, they mm. were hardcore. They were. <laughs> and we saw, and we the, store, the founding legend of Storm's End is the gods kept knocking the castle down, right? It's like that Monty Python thing where like... He built the castle again and it just sank into the swamp. The fourth it sank into the swamp, but the fourth one, in this case, the seventh one stayed up. Yeah, so that is hardcore. You're continuously building in a stormy land that has already wrecked a castle. You're like, well, I'm going to do it again. Like, yeah, that's hardcore, man. I mean, arguably, it's very stubborn. But hey, it worked. He he pulled it off eventually, or they pulled it off eventually. I don't know. If Fine was... line between hardcore and unwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True that. So... If you think about that, storms plus raiders, local and from far away, coming by ship from who knows where, that's pretty hardcore. You get a lot of the human problem and a lot of the weather problem. I'd say that counts. The problem here, though, is it's similar to the Dornish Mountains scenario. We're not exactly sure which houses have it the worst, which ones are actually at the forefront, which get the brunt of the storms. Like, which part of the stormlands is the stormiest? Not exactly sure. It might be Estermont. It might be Tarth, because those are islands, and that stands to region. Reason tends to region. The reason, yeah, actually, that works. Yeah. Anyway, Estermont doesn't seem hardcore from their name. They have a turtle sigil. <laughs> it's like it sounds kind of like nice and unassuming, but actually, yeah, like this is a. You know, they might have fertile crops and fertile land, but like every once in a while, something just rips it all to shreds. Like that's that's tough. And turtles aren't hardcore, they're hard shell. <laughs> yes. <I> there. <laughs> yes, you did. Now, there's also less adaptation. So we talked about like how some of these cultures, based on where they live, it actually changes who they are in small ways. Like you'd see things like the height or additional body fat or less body fat or darker skin or wider noses, whatever. There'd be less of that here because these are more cultural. Adapting to storms is more of a cultural thing. <laughs> there's not like... We're better at storms. Like, what part of your body is better at facing storms than other? Like, that doesn't. There's no evolutionary evolutionary mechanism there. You know, there's. It's all about just building stronger walls and <laughs> thicker coats or whatever. You, so, yeah, and in, in, intelligence could allow a culture to learn when a storm is coming, mm. to learn how to build better, uh, you know, houses or fortification, things like that. But it's all sort of external from your body things technology right, exactly or whatever yeah yeah so that's a good point so the adaptation stuff is very high here and you're right that might actually play a long-term role of them being a little maybe a little cleverer maybe a little have a stronger weather sense like maybe some stormlanders there's a higher incidence of my knee hurts so i know it's going to rain like the slight barometric pressure changes there might be more sensitivity to that in the stormlands but once again we can't it's hard for us to tie this to a specific house there aren't any there isn't necessarily one stormlands house mostly the coastal ones and the southern ones because southern Dor southern stormlands is more susceptible to the pirates and the Dornishmen, and the coasts, all the coasts around the stormlands are more susceptible to storms. So, yeah, that is another. I, I guess there is another, at least potential. You point out like the your knee hurting or something. We have more than the five senses. You always think of like sight, sound, smell, but there's actually I don't know a dozen or more. We can tell like our equilibrium if we're, what's up and down. That's a mm. sense that we have, and humidity. We can sense, and maybe that's even a sub part of your your factory sense but we can detect when the air is more dry or more humid and so when a storm's coming you might be able to feel that right on okay cool you might be more or less in tune to it 
if it matters to you, if a storm's coming, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Sandhelm or Stonehelm rather is another one that comes up as a, as a nominee because it's right there at the border with Dorne. It's in the mountains and it's on the co It's close to the coast. So they might get all of the above. They might have mountain altitude adjustment. They might have storm acclimation, the human side of that. They might have Dornish Raiders and pirates and all this. They might, they might have like all the things that the Stormlands are emblematic of. Most of the dangers are all there, uh, but maybe less of the humidity. Now, humidity is a big problem. As I said at the beginning of this section, wet heat is worse than dry heat for humans. Why? Because wet climate, Remember what I said about your ability to cool your body? It's through sweating. And this, the drying of the sweat is what actually cools you, not the actual sweat. If it's really humid, your sweat doesn't dry. It's pretty easy to understand. So if the, the wetter the air, the harder it is for your sweat to evaporate. Thus, it's harder for your body to be cooled naturally. Water is an evaporative coolant. That's like a... Mm. Uh, factor oh. characteristic of water is an evaporative coolant and that's why sweat works we sweat it evaporates we cool down and you're sweating almost all the time you just don't always see it because it's mm. it's a small amount that evaporates before like it beads up it beads up when you get really hot mm. and so your body's trying to cool down a lot so it emits more more sweat or when it's really humid because the sweat that's being emitted isn't evaporating so you get sweatier and humidity but it, it evaporates almost instantly most of the time, especially in drier climates. And it would also cause, it also causes more destruction of like fabric and, and other like materials that the moisture has more, like some more bacteria and more of these other things. It's just mold and yeah, yeah mold, fosters yeah. mosquitoes and viruses or whatever. And bacteria. mold, that's a, that's a great point. Mold is very dangerous and ancient civilizations or semi-medieval, whatever we want to call them, civilizations don't have a great understanding of how dangerous mold is. So there would be, you know, lots of, that as a health hazard, you know, in various stone structures, this place and wooden, you know, you would have that building up. And I don't really know what dangerous fauna they have. I don't know. Like there's no scorpions, probably. There might be some bad spiders. I don't know if there's probably poisonous snakes, but there's it's so jungly or near rainforesty there that there would be some fauna that aren't in the other central regions like the reach and, and the riverlands that might be more dangerous. And it's easier to get lost in a, in a rainforest like that or to, you know, uh, find yourself like with some unfamiliar plants that might be like poison ivy or something like that. Poison oak, the nasty things like that. Minor things that you need to know about. They aren't going to kill you probably. Oh, some of them will, but most of them are just, yeah, just local knowledge is really important. So dehydration is really bad. You would think, well, why isn't dehydration really bad too? Well, like, yeah, it is. Dehydration will, will kill you but it won't kill you as fast as the inability as, as really high humidity. The, a, a, a statement I read was humans of any kind cannot work. If the temperature is above 90 and the ambient humidity is above 95%, you just cannot work in those conditions. Like period. You'll, you'll drop. You get dehydrated faster because your body keeps trying to sweat to cool down and it's not working. So yeah. Yeah. It's a weird like inverse, like it's wet everywhere, but you're dehydrating really fast because your body is pumping all that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but that's how we work. So think about that for Stormland. Apply that to Stormlanders. Lots of people who are uh, used to extreme weather, but intermittently. Lots of people who are adjusted to humidity in general. Lots of people who maybe have strong knowledge of forests because they live near big ones or uh, what to do in the event of a storm or when you're on the coast, like where to find shelter, what the best place to stand is like, for example, they tell you don't go near a big tree when it's when it's when there's lightning out, even though like intuitively you might be like, ah, tree cover. Well, that's more likely you're more likely hit by lightning that way. So like a stormlander would have more knowledge of things like this, which doesn't necessarily make you more hardcore, but it does. It is interesting. Uh, so Stormlanders have to face a lot. They have to face a lot of raiders. And so they're probably not as, I don't think that they're as hardcore as Dornish, in part because the Dornish, even though the Dornish are part of what makes them hardcore because it's their attacks that toughen them up a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think it's hard to argue that their weather is is worse, even though humidity is more dangerous than dry heat, because that's that's only one of many factors. It sounds like overall the Ullers and the Corgals have it worse. But what do you think, Sean? Where, where do you fall on this? Is, is like, Roughly. I think I'd rather live where there are storms are and try to figure out how to deal with it than live where there is no water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think I'd settle with you there too. What do you think, Ashea? Not sure, huh? Hard to pick, huh? I was I was muted. It was hard. I couldn't scramble to 
to, to get in there. Okay. Uh, sorry. We're moving What's on. What's the question? The question was, where would you rather live? Stormlands? Which which is tougher? Which is more hardcore, do you think? Between where? The Stormlands and Uller and Corgoyle. Stormlands, for sure. You think it's tougher? No, I'd rather live in the Stormlands. Oh, you'd rather live there. Okay, So it's cool. not tougher. Sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's definitely not tougher. I would definitely rather live. I live in Atlanta, Georgia right now, <laughs> which is closer to the Stormlands than um, a lot of places in the U.S. That's true. We are closer uh, to the Stormlands than, yeah, we are. Florida is more stormland Storm, because yeah. there's more storms. Yeah, but we're very close to Florida. So. Yeah, we, we I get a small taste of the humidity of the the hurricanes and storms a little bit. I, I think I can handle it for sure. Yeah, I think I agree. It's pr a pretty easy question, I think, but but it's good to spell it out. All right, easy let's go question to, if you know. Worth the noting, question. there are yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> there are more people and more cities and more you know, uh, it's, it, it, people are dealing with it better in Florida than they are in Arizona. That's true. That's true. They don't have to. They have. They are more used to it. Yeah. Just like when it snowed here in Georgia, we didn't know what the hell to do. Our mayor made this horrible mistake of handled it terribly. <laughs> That's probably not because he's an idiot, but he has little experience. Or I can't remember. Actually, maybe it was she. Doesn't matter. More experience, they probably wouldn't have made that call. And <laughs> yeah. So or those calls. Anyway, let's talk about the Vale, a place where snow does fall. Probably one of the few places we've talked about so far where there's some snowfall. Although winter can do funny things in Westeros. Most of the Vale, I don't think, qualifies. It's pretty similar to the Stormlands, the Riverlands, the West, and the Reach. They're pretty well off for the most part. They have fertile territory. The Vale is a little more isolated from the other regions, but it's not very isolated within itself. There's plenty of places to go inside the Vale, and it's large. There's a few isolated areas. There's definitely toughness there because of the mountain clans are a constant danger, and some of them might qualify as hardcore if you're talking about clans. Oh, I'm going to throw in a few honorable mentions, actually. Some of the islands might qualify. The Aaron Kings, the last thing the Aaron Kings did was add the island nations, the, which were Pebble, Witch Isle, the Paps, and finally the Three Sisters. This was important because, because the Vale is isolated from the other regions by the mountains, it needs to have a lot of trade. It's a lot of ships going back and forth doing things. If they don't take care of those islands just off their coasts, those are absolutely going to turn into pirate kings, raiders, reavers, independent kings. So they got to lock all that down so they can control the shipping. Uh, the sisters were basically all those things. The sisters were nearby, lots of pirating, lots of disruption of trade, wrecking, all sorts of negative influence. And... In many ways, they still are those things and more. The sisters are pretty devoid of resources, pretty poor in farmland, didn't have much to begin with, but they've also been war-torn several times, which has made that even worse. Basically, they've been caught between bigger powers too many times, or they've taken, making, made bad decisions on whose side to take in a greater conflict. For example, they sided with the Blackfires. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't so smart. They tried to go independent during Aegon's Conquest. That didn't work out so well either. <laughs> so they've just kind of like lots of stories like this. And of course, there was the rape of the three sisters, which played out over a very long time where the Starks and the Aarons fought over them and just shredded the whole place. All the islands. Even the Iron Islands have more wealth. The Iron Isles have iron, right? They have that. That's one valuable resource that's useful. And the sisters don't even have that. So... But they have even more incentive to be a pirate. The Ironborn are obviously the more notorious raiding culture we've seen. But the sisters, they actually are near all the ship, the a lot more shipping lanes. They're in the narrow sea. They're close to White Harbor. They're close to Ish, to Gulltown. They're not that far from Bravos. There's a lot more nearby targets. There's a lot more shipping lanes nearby. So the incentive is a lot greater from a proximity standpoint. So this is what they've been, is pirates, raiders, wreckers. For a long time, this culture has been developed to take rather than produce, in part because of their extreme lack of opportunity and self-sufficiency that they can establish there on their homeland. So it's one of those things where you wish one of those greater powers that had taken it over had done more to develop it so that it would not ever revert to the state because it's, it's very susceptible to that. Not to mention the people are just so used to it. It's so part of their history. Uh, the, and to be clear on what wrecking means, if you're not, if I think we've talked about it a few times, but that's when you 
put up a false light on a lighthouse and lure people onto the rocks, which is the opposite of what a lighthouse is supposed to do. It's supposed to lure to guide you away from the around the rocks or towards safety. So uh, that obviously. Now, like unlike some of these other places, we've actually seen part of the Three Sisters. Davos has gone there. We saw it, and this Lord Boral had a. He's fairly powerful in his region, but he's poor. Like his roof is leaking. Uh, he's got bad teeth, you know. He's got like things that you don't see that often from people with money, because he doesn't actually have that much money. And they're they have a very per pervasive culture in that they have been a certain way for a long time, and they're stubbornly holding to that because no one's really making them change. But they're not really religious. That's another difference between them and Ironborn. And their religion isn't a big part of it. Uh, there's no obvious adaptations from them. I don't think that like they have a lot of storms, but like the stormlands, that's not something you can really adapt to with your evolution. That's more of a cultural adaptation, but they do have the, the sorcery, the, the blood magic or the breeding with a fantastical creature in their history, the mark, the webbed hands and feet that sometimes appear, which Davos witnesses on Lord Borel. So I'd say that adds to their hardcoreness, <laughs> having some genetics from the deep ones, perhaps. That's certainly the prevailing theory. It's certainly my favorite prevailing theory. It's pretty cool and creepy. So on the other hand, um, like, are they really that tough? Like they're very aggressive. They're very violent. Maybe they're used to getting by with very little. So in that sense, they're tough because they probably, the average sister man probably has more like food scarcity in their history and more times where they couldn't eat for a while. They may be tougher about surviving without food, but the climate stuff, the regional stuff, I'm not as sure about that. What do you think, Sean? I was, I was thinking that I would rather live uh, in the desert than I'd rather live in with house Oler than with uh, the three sisters, but mm. I don't know if that necessarily makes them more hardcore. I just feel like, they've been pillaged more whereas you're less likely to be pillaged with house oil. like no one's kind of gonna move through the deserts to come to your sulfur river and attack your village or your cat they'll leave you alone but these islands have been parts of wars over and over again so i i, I would feel safer however hardcore you have to be what it's however tough it is to live day to day i feel you like i would have a more stable life yeah, yeah, you could say that that one has a, a lower ceiling but a higher floor. That's as a good it were, way, you yeah. know, yeah. like you're never it's never gonna be as bad at the hellhold as it will and at its worst at the sisters. But at its best yeah. at the sisters, it will be better than at the best at the hellhold, potentially. That's I, a good point. I'm also hesitant to call them hardcore because they kind of they're 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 working through like unfairness and trickery like if they had to mm. you know go head to head and battle with someone i don't know if they would do as well they you put up fake lights and make ships crash and then go <laughs> pillage them you know like that's ah, not hardcore that's deceitful you know it's yeah like, yeah i think i see where you're coming from there i, I tend to agree I, I think that these guys were worth mention but i do think that ultimately putting them under the microscope they're they're interesting and dangerous you gotta be wary of them but hardcore Maybe not to the definition we've laid out, you know, hardcore in some attitudes, but not based on like their populations, like survivability and all that stuff. So, yeah. But, yeah. So our definition of hardcore, I don't think they fit, but they might they would probably fit other definitions of hardcore. If you saw those sisters, <laughs> if you saw those three, <laughs> and, and, <you'll, laughs> <That's hardcore. laughs> and you notice the amalgam here, we're treating them in like a like a monolith when actually there's a few different houses there but they are as true they're fairly similar as far as we know we don't have the ability to differentiate them that much i wasn't glossing over that i just don't know better uh honorable mention to the burned men and some of the other clans but especially the burned men burning off a piece of yourself to prove your manhood is pretty damn hardcore I, I, it's kind of unnecessary maybe but it's also pretty recent it isn't like some ancient tradition that they've carried forward as, as far as we know this started right after the dance of the dragons this burning of themselves so because they're, they're an offshoot of the painted dogs who don't have any sort of history like that of hacking off a finger. Like, yeah, they used to hack off a finger. We burn it off. It's kind of the same. It just hurts more. You know, it's just slower, slower and more painful and out. Yeah. But they, so that's pretty hardcore. And they live in very extreme climate. Like they don't live. 
they don't have the, the nice parts of the veil aren't open to them. They have to live in the high mountains and the woods. Like you see Tyrion's hanging out with them and how little they have in terms of food and infrastructure and all that. So to survive in that, you got to be pretty hardcore, I think. They're not a house. Yeah, they... So that part yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you count them as a house, but I think they might be the most hardcore so far. We might okay. not have as much detail or information or history on them, but I think that living in a pretty, a relatively harsh remote environment and being borderline persecuted and choosing to hack off body parts to prove yourself like all that combined i think that's putting them on par with anyone else uh, that's yeah that's a pretty good argument you, you tend to agree shay or you think the burn men are just weird <laughs> uh, i don't know you don't know okay the Iron Isles. The Ironborn are a tough people overall, but the entire region doesn't qualify as extreme, right? The entire region doesn't. Maybe a lot of it does. So we'll, we'll highlight a few of the more uh, extreme houses here, or maybe one in particular, really. Contrary to popular belief, not everyone on the islands is poor. That's another thing. It's, it's like, the yes, a lot of them are because it's sort of like the Three Sisters in that there's not a lot of local opportunity. There's fishing. There's iron mines. <laughs> there's trade, but you you got to have a ship for that, right? You can't just, I'm going to be a trader, you know, <laughs> you, you got to like find a way into that business or be born into it. Maybe just like the Stormlands and just like the three sisters storms are a big problem. The Iron Islands, they have a whole God who is their basically their devil. Their Satan is the storm God. So they clearly have a negative view of storms, which makes a lot of sense given how much their culture depends on sailing and coastal living and things like that. Uh, but, you could say they're remote in some ways, but not that remote. They're not that far from the from the mainland, and they are they're this sailing culture. So in a, in essence, it's not that remote for them. They have pretty easy access back and forth because they do so much sailing. It's not like a desert where no matter how you cross it, it's going to be hard. Like there's no way across. You, you have a way across the sea on a ship, or you don't. <laughs> you can't. It's, it's really there is all there is to it. One thing that usually goes hand in hand with remote is unexplored, unsettled, uh, you know, unknown. But that's not really the case for Iron Islands, right? It's it, there aren't like these islands that no one's ever been to. They're all they've been settled and civilized and mapped out. That I think that you know, kind of like you were saying, they're not really remote, you know. Yeah, yeah, with an exception or two, which is this house, Farwind slash Lonely Light. There is a also, by the way, a house far wind of Sealskin Point, which is on Great Wick. But this is the one we're going to focus on. A much smaller and farther out spot, as described here. Quote. A secondary island grouping lies eight days sail to the northwest in the Sunset Sea. There, seals and sea lions make their rookeries on windswept rocks too small to support even a single household. On the largest rock stands the keep of House Farwind, named the Lonely Light, for the beacon that blazes atop its roof day and night. Queer things are said of the far winds and the small folk they rule. Some say they lie with seals to bring forth half-human children, whilst others whisper that they are skin changers who can take the forms of sea lions, walrus, even spotted whales, the wolves of the Western Seas. Spotted That's whales hilarious. are probably orca, aren't they? Yeah, the wolves <laughs> of the Western Seas. I love that. That's a great quote. It's like, you yeah. know, chicken chicken of the sea. The wolves, <laughs> of, the sea. The wolves <laughs> of the sea chase chase the chicken of the sea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you've ever witnessed a, a herd of sea chickens fleeing from a, <laughs> a sea wolf, it's really put it on your bucket list. <laughs> so House Farwind has a claim to be the most remote of any house under the domain of the Iron Throne. And as the quote says, they're certainly the westest in Westeros. They are the westerish, westerishness of Westeros. Yeah, you can see them on the map here, sort of. It's not even on the maps. It's sort of on the map. It has to be like one of those things where a lot of times you see a U.S. map in Hawaii and Alaska are like separately it's put in a corner because they don't want to show all of Canada. So yeah. that's kind of what we have here. Lonely Light's kind of like that. It's, it's the Alaska, Hawaii of Westeros, where it's too far off the map to fit. Now, given what's been said about them, like they lie with seals to bring forth half-human children. Think about how that's a very similar line. They lie with the others to create half-human children. 
uh, of the free folk had said about them. It's almost the same line, but substitute seals for others. <laughs> you know, <laughs> either way, you get skin changers. That's the idea that's being pushed here: is that some of the far winds are skin changers, which is so cool because it makes sense that there would be skin changers elsewhere in the north. I mean, we have some examples historically, like in the Reach and elsewhere, but that seems to have died out now. But it seems to still linger in house farwin, which makes sense on the like genetic scale where you these guys are inbreeding a lot probably because they live eight days sail from the Iron Islands, which are already pretty out of the way, right? So they're just a single household is all it supports. Where are they finding new brides? Like who wants to go live there? Like, yes, I can go live in the remotest place in Westeros where people are said to lie with seals yeah i'll go marry into that house like they probably have a hard time attracting new brides which given their origins as ironborn they've probably stolen quite a few brides over the years yeah, like, that's yeah. where there is an answer to that question unfortunately yeah, yeah. they are ironborn let's not forget that the little we see to them they come off as dreamy and weird but that's just the one guy we see at the king's moot there's it's we can't use that sample size of one to think that they're all like that. There's probably been some more violent guys or more outwardly aggressive seeming far winds. Think about the the ultimate far wind. The ultimate far wind would be like a what would we call them? A Cthulhu Viking skin changer. <laughs> like whoa! Like think of the advantage if you can skin change into a whale. You could just swim up to shore, see the, the settlement, see that it's undefended, go find another ship to attack, like your range for finding things to pirate to pirate on, to, to attack, or just swim to the Drowned God's watery halls and check out the ocean floor. Like, whoa, that's weird and cool. Like this, I, some of it may not even be quite be hardcore, but it's really cool. So that's, we got to decide what's creepy cool and what's hardcore i see i really wonder about the breathing part of it yeah. you know like like i think about like the, the skin changing dreams and stuff like what would would they wake up like feeling like they were drowning oh. ever, you know like or would they wake up and like if, when they breathe air that feels like drowning like they're choking on the air i don't know oh, how would that affect cool. your, your you yeah this is good good imagination here shay or like <laughs> what if you what if you wake up having been a kraken you're like i, I had 10 arms and then Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're like trying to, yeah. Like, where are the other arms? Like, I'm trying to grab my <laughs> cup of water by bedside with an arm that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, it is just, it is way different having different limbs than, yeah, the, the skin changers we know, but they've skin changed relatively similar physiologically creatures, like another mammal. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, like, it's just, it, those are more similar than, yeah. Birds, the, the birds are of kind skin. of. Yeah, maybe uh, as as different as sea creatures. Ooh. Yeah, we don't see them thinking a lot about flapping or their wings or the yeah. beaks. They're about the differences. But but that is a good call, Sean, because when uh, Varamir is having his thinking about skin changers, he he was taught that bird skin changers are different. They they moon a lot. They just stare up at the sky. Mm. Yeah. They are becoming more bird like they want to go back up there. It's like that it is becoming part of them. So, so this yeah. line of thinking is very accurate. Like Rob gets a little more wolfish. Yeah. You know, and they 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 do sort of merge like the the wolf gray wind becomes a little more like Rob, but Rob becomes a little more like gray wind. And so this should apply to other skin changes. Yeah, he becomes more like a kraken or a Whale, a whale, yeah. Or a bird, like a seabird. That would be pretty valuable too for all most of these same things we've described, like searching out scouting out your enemies I'm sorry but i'm just picturing it all of a sudden you just like fill your mouth with water and you just spit water at your friends <laughs> like a whale <laughs> <laughs> yeah just blow hole someone like gotcha <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> like taking this to the extreme a really powerful far wind skin changer could skin change into a whale and like ram a ship with it like actually control it to doing like uh, it's full capacity or skin change into a kraken and pull it under you know crazy stuff like that. that that is this type of stupid aggressive thing an ironborn would do yeah. what they could do <laughs> is like tell when and where storms are forming and what yes. directions are going and avoid and them, yes. safe harbor and save lives <laughs> and increase commerce but instead they destroy something in. <laughs> yep yep that's the whole and this is part of the hardcore aspect that does not exist with the sisters which is that their religion tells them to do these things it enforces these beliefs it's like you won't get to heaven unless you die in combat against 
someone who isn't of our religion. The sisters don't have that like backing them up. They're more just about, oh, we're desperate. We got to steal because otherwise we'll die. You know, the Ironborn have a little bit of that, but it's more like, no, this is the right way to live. Like it's justified. It's for it's pushed on. It's like it's yeah. It's, it's a convenient excuse if you ask me. <laughs> it is. I, I kind of, I tend to agree, but but they don't see it. They don't see it that way. Like they yeah. aren't like, this is just an excuse for me to be violent. Like I'm, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell anyone. No, they really, they like live and breathe it. I think, especially someone like Victorian, you know, or, or Aaron, even more so. Yeah. It's some not clearly Aaron. live and breathe it more than others. Asha, yeah. not so much. What, who's the Roderick, the reader, not so much, you not, know? Yeah. There's absolutely exceptions, which is why we can't paint the whole culture this way either. Uh, I, I mean, Asha, you could say is fairly hardcore, like she's tough and strong and, and does brave things. But I don't but you know, maybe not to the level of the Ullers or or the far winds, maybe in this. And again, using the definition we've laid out. And uh, yeah, and Gilbert Farwin, the guy we see at the King's Mood, he also promises to lead everybody west and says, you know, there's lands there. We can go to them. And, and you think, well, if anyone would know that, like maybe is skin, is skin changing and like taking your whale all the way west and like just saying, yeah, I really did see it through the, a whale's eyes or through a seabird's eyes or something like that. They really did see these far lands. Maybe they don't have an idea just how far it is. But this is a recurring story from the far winds. It's not just from it's like an, it's in the world of ice and fire also that this is a recurring tale that the far winds tell, which means there might be some truth to it. And we do know. I mean, there you Clearly, if you sail far west enough, you will get to Essos, I guess, or something else. You'll def definitely get to land eventually. I mean, I don't suppose it's flat. I don't suppose it's like Lord of the Rings where you sail far enough west and you go to, you end up in whatever it is, Valinor or whatever that is. <laughs> or is that the east? Oh, that is the west. Yeah, it's still the west. So anyway, that I don't think Westeros works that way. But either way, the, the far wind's attitude towards this is, is interesting. Uh, so you could say they're hardcore in part because they're ironborn in part because they have the the lack of support, like food and, and supplies. They're not going to have much access to trade and things like that. And the isolation is extreme. The toughness comes from that. Accepting that separation, maybe some mental toughness, you know, like being part of a culture that's just so a world apart from everybody else. Like the ironborn are already a culture apart. And now you got people that even the ironborn kind of shun. So like that that's a different kind of toughness because you just have to accept that you're kind of an outcast house. And that's, that's not like physical toughness. It's not adjusting the climate, but man, you got to being an outcast house is, it's probably pretty tough. It'll probably make you tougher. If it doesn't break you, you might have more independence of thought might feel like more capable or self-confident if it doesn't break you. So I think they're the best choice amongst the ironborn. There, there's surely other choices, but kind of like some of these other regions, there's not a lot to differentiate them. The two lesser isles are Black Tide and Salt Cliff. But like, are they more hardcore because they're a little poorer than the other, other Iron Islands? I don't know if that's enough of a differentiator. So we'll just stick with Farwind as our only highlighted house among the Iron Islands with the caveat that there are others that would probably count as hardcore to a lower degree. All right. What do you all think about the Far Winds overall in terms of the hardcore? Is it more of like we're they're cool because they're mystical or are they actually as hardcore? Or is it maybe maybe we don't know enough because the one guy we saw seemed kind of not that violent? I don't know. Yeah, I'm suspicious. I'm suspicious what they're all really like in the first place. Hmm. We have such little information. It might be a paradise island and they just want everyone to think it's awful. Leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> We've, We've been, got it made out here for all this time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep that, keep that charade going. <laughs> no one's going to sail over there to check, right? <laughs> go and go. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go swing by lonely light see what's happening. They, they've always got a good party going on. Yeah. So they are, e even if they're not hardcore, they're extremely unique. They're one of the most unique houses in all of Westeros, I think. And like with the, some of Shea's ideas, some of the things we talked about with the skin changing, they're a topic to come back to and a house I hope we learn a little more about. I don't know that they're likely to be a big part of the story, but George could throw in a nugget here or there. There's, there's a, there might be a, a call for it, you know, skin changing houses that aren't northerners. You know, that's that's interesting. Which is a segue to the north. Yeah, the North itself. Again, the North is extremely large, not as quite as large as some people say it is, but we're going to start at the neck since we're waking our way, making our way norther, northerly, and the neck is kind of a world of its own. It's a little bit of a microcosm. What we'll see in the North is similar to some of the things we saw in Dorne, which is that some of these locations were not claimed quickly.
because they are in harsh lands, lands that needed some taming before they were fit for human habitation. One thing that's a little different about the North, it's probably more issues with wild beasts, probably fewer poisonous animals, but more like bears and wolves that will actually attack you. Whereas I don't know that there's a lot of large animals in the desert that will just come right at you. You might, you might step on a scorpion and get stung, but that's a different sort of danger to like a giant bear that's going to come try to maul you to death or a shadow cat or a wolf or a dire wolf. So that's a different sort of concern, a different style of hardcore when you're living amongst dangers from animals that we mostly haven't spoken of to this point. Most of the dangers we've spoken of are human dangers, raiders, pirates, reavers, etc. Now we have, in some places in the North, we have that plus this. Um, although maybe less in some cases. Like if you're far inland in the North, you're not going to be too worried about pirates and raiders. But you might be even more worried about some of these other factors. So the neck. They've got their own episode. We've, we've got a whole episode on the Kranigmen, so we'll spend a little less time on here than we might have otherwise. It's not quite as cold there. They don't have to worry nearly as much about raids. People don't raid the Kranigmen. <laughs> There's not much to take. <laughs> and they have their poison arrows and their great home field advantage. So it's not a good plan anyway. And it's hard to get there. Yeah, just so many reasons why it's not a good idea. They appear to have a lot of adaptations, both biological and cultural. Uh, and they are believed superstitiously to have even more, <laughs> like like the Frey belief that they can breathe mud. That's probably not true. They probably can't breathe mud, but they might be able to use like little reeds to breathe like proto low tech snorkels, which would come off as breathing mud, you know, to someone who doesn't mm -hmm. know better. And of course, for the rest of the similarities, we'll see a lot of things that are similar to Dorn, but dealing with cold weather instead of hot weather. Stubborn culture that's endured cold and free folk and Andals and Ironborn. The farther north you go, the colder and more free folky and sparser it gets. Maybe less Ironborn, but still the rest gets worse. Here's a good quote from the World of Ice and Fire to help us set the stage for the entire north. Quote. The Northmen still retain something of the old ways and their customs and their manner. Their life is harder, and so they are hardened by it. And the pleasures that in the South are considered noble are thought childish and less worthy than the hunting and brawling that the Northmen love best. It's a good example of even in world what you might consider hardcore is, has variance based on your, your own cultural upbringing. George has compared the North to Scotland. So it's something of a model for us in terms of climate and, and other factors. Obviously, Scotland is tiny compared to Westeros, but Westeros as a whole is sort of like England made much, much larger and flipped 180 and Ireland stacked on top or inside it. So it works fairly well. Eons is an important distinction too. Uller and Corgyle, for example, those houses aren't super old, maybe a thousand, two thousand years old, maybe even less. But some of these Northern houses are much, much older. They have been adjusting to their surroundings for longer. They've had longer to acclimate, longer to adapt. And that's pretty meaningful. Like 2,000 years of adapting versus 8,000 years of adapting. As more physiological changes will have occurred in that time. Uh, yet some old traits remain, right? There's still a lot of, lar like some of those traits may have vanished from the early North, but some of them are still there because they're useful. The Mormons and Umbers are on our short list, which is a funny thing to call it because this list is of big people. <laughs> uh, I said this at the beginning. It's true even in the animal kingdom. Cold climates often come with extra size. Think of the woolly mammoth, things like that. The biggest land walking animal ever. Extreme cold weather. Polar because bears are big. Polar bears. Yeah, they're huge. They're like the, one of the largest types of bears, if not the largest. It's because that extra size is, is a barrier against the cold, and protecting your vital internal organs, keep protecting that body temperature, which is really important. Internal body temperature regulation is super important for our survival. Your body will always try to regulate itself to that floor temperature that it's meant to be at and animals are the same if you have extra layers whether that's clothing or fat or fur it protects your vital organs right and so that's obviously the first cultural adaptation that's necessary is clothing for humans but animals are obviously different but it's the animals that have adapted to cold weather that you wear the furs of mm -hmm. <laughs> right so it's it's still yeah. like it's, you're using their you're kind of co-opting their adaptation or their evolution uh if we're looking at Mormont and Bear Island, good example, but also an example of a house we've already done, as they have their own episode. So I definitely direct you to that for a fuller treatment. But you can immediately see some of the things we're talking about. Very isolated. They're on an island in the very far north. 
It's not very rich. We know that from Lynette Mormont's experience. <laughs> <laughs> very firsthand, almost well, secondhand, I suppose. Still pretty well attested to. Uh, not that close to the shore, not super far, but it's mostly close to the, the parts of the shore it's close to are also pretty sparse and very cold. They face both raiders from beyond the wall and the Iron Islands. And of course, they have the low resources as well. The series is particularly full of tough Mormons, too, both TV and book. And the TV show, as much as it didn't focus too much on lesser houses, the Mormons had a lot of representation on the TV show of toughness. Like whether it's Jorah, who's, you know, there's issues with him. There's no doubting his toughness, though. Gior Mormont, same. And then little Liana Mormont, like, come on. They, they, that was like their main, you know, house virtue is toughness, right? That's one of the things you see about them. And this comes from being raised in this climate where the Mormons are a little different in that they have a lot more uh, presence and regard for women and a lot more of them are warriors. And that by itself, I think, adds to the hardcoreness. Like you have a lot of these cultures that keep their women from fighting. And like a lot of the ones that are in the extremes are more likely to have women warriors. The Dornish have a lot of women warriors. And the North has a, a decent chunk of them too, but a lot like an outsized proportion of them come from Bear Island. You can't afford prejudices when you have more limited resources. When you need everyone point. to be tough, you can't afford to be like, uh, yeah, you women aren't allowed to do X, Y, Z or whatever you know group you want to be prejudiced against. You kind of need everyone to be together and working and be tough about it, you know. And when they, and especially when it's proven that they're good at it, like, well, these women are great yeah. at it. Like, these are tough, capable women. Why would you not want to continue that? <laughs> you know, I mean, there are some reasons. I don't know that they're very good ones though. <laughs> So that's really big. So they they have all the things, extreme climate, ex pretty darn remote, lots of problems from humans and beasts, bears in particular, I would suppose. And yeah, they, so they check off all the boxes. Mormont has an argument to be up there with Uller and Corgyle and some of these others. So I, I think uh, it's a strong case. What do you think, Sean? Yeah, I agree. And I, I want to... Maybe this isn't quite as fair to compare to Oler or, or Argyle, but the but compared to like the Iron Islanders or the sisters, they're better at um I have to say Sean, having honor. Been... They're not like oh yeah leeching off other people. Does that make sense? They're okay. they're able to within this tough environment still do it on their own. So yeah. I'm just gonna I have to point out that you said Argyle, which, which is, is funny because we started talking about Scotland as a comparison. Yeah. So <laughs> you very yeah. much meant Corgyle. <laughs> and I think we all knew what you meant, but I had a, a very clear image of a Corgyle and an Argyle sweater. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the actor who plays G or Mormon, I'm forgetting his name. He's been in a lot of things. He's Scottish. <laughs> so that's fitting too. <laughs> that's right. He's probably worn some Argyle in his day, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yes, the Scots make great wool, don't they? Argyle is a form of, form James of very Cosmo. nice wool. What's that? James Cosmo. Oh, yeah, James Cosmo. Yes, thank you. Very good. Um, so, they're very strong. What Do you think more monster up there too, Shea? Is Would you have anything to add to that, or you just kind of agree, or what? Yeah, I think they are. I think I think because they have both the extreme climate of the, um, the extreme climate that our southern houses had to face, but also the extreme uh, pillaging, the extreme... Uh, violence that the sisters face mm, so i think yes. they have both of the hardcore elements there without inflicting it on their neighbors like the sisters do. yeah 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 although and, don't you know, don't don't the mormons haven't they sometimes attacked i don't know is that was that something they a little bit most of that bit, was just they joined bit. another attack on them. yeah they they helped <laughs> yeah 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 i just i felt like i had there i felt like there were times that they attacked ironborn and it wasn't but like you know kind yeah. of a and they, they were fully conquered by the Ironborn for a while, too. Which yeah. Is, that was, must have been rough. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, I think it, that's that's rough. <laughs> here's another uh, measure, especially in the wake of what we were just talking about. If you lined up all of House Oler or all of, you know, these other groups that we're talking about and all of House Mormont, you got about 50% of these other houses who haven't been allowed to train or fight 
or all this other stuff. Mm. So, but all the more my women have, right? So Good on point. average, <laughs> they're into your, their average is going to be higher hardcore. So. If Probably, I mean, that's point. really true. The or others too, because the women true, are yeah. more likely to fight there as well. Oh, um, true. Yeah. Good point. I wasn't thinking about that. Maybe not quite as likely, but, but not, more likely yeah. than most. Not as likely yeah. as the Mormont women, but more likely than most of Western. Yeah. Cause it sounds like the yes, Mormont yeah. women are the most likely to be warriors of any house. Quite pilot. They might have that claim. I'm not yeah, yeah. Whereas I, didn't I think it's specifically just, think about that yeah. question, but I think that's there's that's probably true. Yeah. Whereas, but if you compare it to any just average northern house, average Riverland, any other region's house. Yeah. All of if northern you looked at the, the top ten houses whose women are likely to be warriors, more than half of them might come from Dorne. Yeah, I would agree with <laughs> that's that. That's true. I would agree with that as well. That that's kind of what true. I'm saying. Is that the number one is Mormont, but then the rest of the top five is Dornish or whatever. Mm. Yeah. That's a good call. So very high on the list, Mormont come, registers. I imagine that's true for many of y'all as well. But we, of course, as all of these go, we'd like to hear from you if you feel differently. Since we have covered House Mormont in their own episode, and there is a lot more that y'all can hear about them there, I wanted to throw in another house that's nearby that's similar, maybe not quite as bad, but uh, worth a mention, I think. And that's House Glover of Deepwood Mott. They're very near to House Mormont. And we know that, for example, Jorah's first wife was a Glover. They probably have married each other quite a few times. They have a lot of the same conditions, not quite as remote. They're not on an island. But the Western North is pretty remote, pretty sparse overall. So it is still very that much that. And it's probably a little bit warmer because they're a little bit farther south. Not much, though. Not much at all. I mean, it's almost directly due south of Bear Island. And then you would argue that they probably have more danger from free folk raids because the free folk raiders usually aren't on ship. They are sometimes. And it's definitely been said plenty of times that the Bear, Bear Island's been hit by free folk raiders. But free folk raiders are a lot more likely to just climb the wall and go by land. And that puts them square in the path of Deepwood Mott if they're heading south to where there would be people. Because if you're raiding north of Deepwood Mott, like what are you finding? Like crofters, villages? Like there's not much to raid there. You're going to need to get to a little more populated area, which this would be. So it's about as far north as you get on the mainland before you get to the wall, the, the Night's Watch's territory, which is extremely sparse. And uh, they would have had to also worry about children of the forest and giants back in the day. Now, this, of course, isn't that relevant now, but it's still worth mentioning that it would have been part of carving this spot out in the first place. And the Glovers are ancient. They were first men kings. They were subjugated by the Starks after having been established. So very, very old. Can I can I make an interjection about Absolutely. this uh, warrior women thing? Sure. Um, I found one, a quote from George, where he was asked, do the women of Dorne fight? And in a suspect, Martin, he said, some do. The Sand Snakes, for instance, but it's not the rule. And then notably, I found it really interesting that I think it's just because of how many characters we see, really. But this Reddit post where they compiled like women warriors, mm -hmm. the most highborn women warriors were in the Riverlands that they found. Like on average, because you think you have like Agnes Blackwood, Alisanne Blackwood, Sabbath of Frey, John Kill Dark, Melanie Piper. Interesting. So like they actually, well, I think it's just that we've heard of more of them. There's more wars we, in the Riverlands. We, yeah, yeah, we hear of more of yeah. them than we would. But I found that super interesting uh, to That's think about. That's a good point. Yeah, Black Alley Blackwood. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, the ones out. I said, I said Sam the Frey and Melanie yeah. Piper and John Kiel Dark. Those right. are all well, John Kiel Dark is more Crownlands, I guess, but it's like on the on other the line. border. Yeah, it's close. It's on by. the border. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would have maybe called that Crownlands if I had been making this post, I guess. Uh so that's good. That's that's good. That's good. Um Yeah, I anyway, just wanted good, to just wanted information. To clarify that. West of Deepwood Mott is the very mystical and interesting and unexplored from us readers perspective, Sea Dragon Point. There are werewood circles there. There's lots of trees there still. It's where the Warg King was defeated by the Starks, which probably means the Glovers helped. If the Glovers were subjugated by the Starks and they're right next to the Warg King's dom domains, they were probably a participatory vassal. The Starks would have probably called on them to help, if not the entire North or whoever they had at the time, because they hadn't subjugated the whole North by the time of the Warg King. And this just keeps coming up. Anytime we talk, we started talking about it with the uh, with the far winds, but it's going to pop up for all the rest of these houses in the north. 
there's always the skin changer factor. There's always oh, to throw that into the mix. Like there's got, there's been some Glover skin changers, there's been some Mormon skin changers. We don't exactly know who they were, how they lived their lives, whether they were the Lord or, uh, you know, second or third son or daughter and how that was used or not used during their time. Do they have like a kind of a regular thing they used to do back in the day when someone was born with these powers or do they just kind of keep it on the down low? So they have a lot of threats around them. The, the beasts, the ironborn, the free folk, the weather, but all they have is a wooden castle. That's <laughs> thousands of years hmm. and they have a wooden castle. They never upgraded stone, which kind of implies they don't have exactly have a lot of wealth. So they definitely don't fit into the category of extremely wealthy lords that have gotten soft over the over years because of their income has just allowed them to live easy. So that definitely doesn't apply here. And the western part of the north in general just seems very empty. It's very like the stony shore. And this is all the this is these are the lands Asha is describing that could have people living in them, and they might as well be their people. But yeah, they're just no one's living there. <laughs> it it might go hand in hand with another point we've made that sometimes there's a fine line or, or a connection between hardcore and uh, stubborn. Right. So, okay. Maybe they're just stuck in their old ways. This wood castle is good enough for us. We don't need stone. Yeah. <laughs> As I they mean, shiver through the night. <laughs> yeah. Right. One thing they do have is plenty of fire. We're hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, we're hardcore shivering right now. So, yeah. They have <laughs> source of firewood. No problem. For that's one thing they won't have any issue with. It might still be really cold. The, the amount of fire they need to drive the cold away might be substantial, but they're basically in the wolf's wood. So, it shouldn't have any trouble with that one thing that's uh they've got available unlike you know in the desert when it gets cold at night and they're like well where's the where's what are we doing for warmth here you know we have no no wood where's the cold wood <laughs> yeah where's the cold wood <laughs> the only one here is ironwood which doesn't burn <laughs> so that kind of feels hardcore like werewoods they're intimidating heart trees are kind of scary but not to northerners so that that maybe like to an outsider maybe feels a little hardcore but to them it's like comforting it's like your gods are here with you so i don't know it still kind of feels a little hardcore if you think about the way they used to worship like with the entrails and the trees and the blood sacrifice and all that so back in the day maybe more so now we pointed out the toughness that was on display with the marmons just on the characters that we see on screen it is absolutely true for the glovers too not quite as boss as the Mormon, not quite as front and center, but very important both in recent and current times. Galbart Glover, very capable leader, important part of Rob's army, eventually is one of the two trusted men sent into the neck with Mage Mormont, <laughs> another trusted tough person from the north, with Rob's hidden orders and knowledge of his will, which we discussed very recently in the riddle of Rob's will. His brother, Robit, total badass, big dude. The guy, he's the guy that pulled off with Arya the weasel soup incident. He led the Northerners on that play. He was the one that voluntarily got captured by the bloody mummers in order to do a maneuver against them. Like, you're voluntarily going into their capture. I mean, they are part of the plan, but still, you're trusting the bloody mummers, you know? Like, yeah, that's, that's pretty hardcore. And then he moves on and is doing this stuff with Wyman Manderley behind the scenes to try to get Rickon restored to the North. These guys are proving their metal for serious. Like, they're doing all that. They're given a lot of tough jobs and doing it well, which really implies, like, this is a house that produces capable people. Going back another generation, the one survivor of Brandon Stark's party that went to demand the death of Rhaegar. Come out and die, Rhaegar. And then Ares had them all killed. Well, he didn't have them all killed. Remember, he had one of them not killed. That was Ethan Glover. Ethan Glover was one of Brandon's squires. So you've got one another, another piece of evidence that another Glover was worthy of being squire to the heir of Winterfell, right? And then he survived for some reason, which is still an open mystery. I have no idea why Ares didn't kill him. And then the poor dude just joined Ned Stark to go to the Tower of Joy. And obviously he didn't make it back from that <laughs> because only Hal and Reed did. So we have these Glovers in very important roles, doing tough guy things, being trusted with hardcore jobs and, and, and you know, warrior general type situations. So they get a lot of points from what the current characters are doing <laughs> to prove the badassness. And they've got a pretty solid resume in terms of where they live, the dangers they face. I still think they don't quite measure up to Mormont, 
but I think they were worthy of mention because they're pretty close. They're not that far behind. Is that how you see it, Sean? Would you agree Glover's a little behind Mormont or maybe maybe, maybe if that squire maybe if that squire had survived the Tower of Joy, then I would like <laughs> Uh, was it quite the, hardcore enough the reed survived <laughs> not the not the clover yep. <laughs> there wasn't and a i did want to point out there. the reeds as being hardcore those swamp yeah. dwellers so. that's right <laughs> he figured it out that's right okay and then honorable mention to the hill clans of the north we'll give it to wall you know a uh, big bucket wall the walls are considered the most powerful so we'll highlight them they have even hard a harder time with the weather they live up in the mountains and hills in the north that's really bad that's where it gets the coldest i mean it's hard to imagine maybe you go farther north it gets colder than that but in the region of the north that's probably the coldest it gets is up in those hills and mountains and that's where these guys have lived for a long time and you might think that leaves them relatively free from fighting but except from each other but fighting each other is a pretty big deal. They do fight each other a lot. And they do fight the Ironborn. The Ironborn have occupied a lot of regions near them. And they've had to have a lot of encounters with them. Which, that'll toughen you up. Having to fight the Ironborn, no doubt. Like, ask the Malisters. Ask uh, the, the Mormonts. So these are kind of like you know, frozen mountains I versus think... desert mountains. <laughs> Go ahead. One thing I think might give the edge and hardcoreness to the colder climates than the warm is because one thing in the warm climates that you do to, to, to make it is don't expend energy. You just have to like get in the shade and chill out. Right. Mm. But in the cold climates, just to survive through a day, it takes a bunch of hard work. You have to go chop firewood. You know, you have to go out in the cold to get food and bring it back in. Calories. You have to heat your home. Yeah. Right. If you're burning calories, you're moving and you're working just to make it through a regular day. So you leave there to go to a nicer environment and someone wants you to do something that they might think of as tough. You're like, this is easy. easy. I do this every day. <laughs> this is like, you know, I, done I, early. I got out of the army. <laughs> I got out of the army and went to work at Blockbuster and was like, there's nothing you could ask me to do here. This is hard as being an 82nd Airborne Division, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know that I was hardcore, but it was relatively easy, right? Yeah. So I think someone from Dorne going up into a cold climate, having to survive, might be overwhelmed. Someone from the north going to a hot climate might be like, well, what are we supposed to do now? Just <laughs> relax in the shade? That's how we survive? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good point. So they're obviously they show their toughness and their dedication to how Stark it shows their their hardcore ability to, to take on a, an enemy, whether it's a local enemy like the Boltons or an invader like the Ironborn. They're very protective of their territory and of their liege lord. I, I think that gives them some points for for hardcoreness, which because we, we've uh, included that as part of our definition of fighting against incursions or just fighting, making, you know, <laughs> if you fight, that'll make you tougher, I suppose. If <laughs> As a culture, maybe not as an individual, depends, but often as an individual as well. So something that we can get a little stronger handle on is the farthest north house that's considered part of the north proper, which is the Umbers and Last Hearth. And if any house has evidence of giant's blood, which is even on their sigil, <laughs> the giant breaking its chains, then it is House Umber. And... They are also the house that hates the free folk, the wildlings, more than any other, as they are most likely to be raided by them more than any other northern house. They have endured the most free folk raids, most wilding raids over the years. Moores, a.k.a. Crowfood's daughter, shout out to Amanda Crowfood's daughter, who's making videos again. She was uh, on a sabbatical for a while, but she's back at it. And we had worked together on a episode about... Uh, the Last of the Giants and Giants Blood and Brandon the Builder. One of those is a Patreon episode, and one of them is uh, not Giants when Giants roamed. There will be another she's one. Got a lot of, she's Go got a lot of good insights. Sorry to interrupt her. She does. She does. Second the the shout out. Absolutely. So Crow Food's daughter. That story fits right here too because Moore's his daughter was carried off by the Free Folk. That's who she's channeling as her kind of character for her YouTube channel, and. That's obviously a reason to hate if your daughter was stolen by this, these people. And this map, you can see they're by the last river. So the last hearth and the last river, it's the, basically the 
I suppose it's named the last river because it's the last river before the wall. Cause there are rivers beyond the wall. So it isn't technically the last river going northwards, but it is the last river in the North. So that is pretty important. That's the, shows you where they derive most likely their fresh water and allows them to trade with down river with houses like the Manderleys and any other house, smaller houses along last river. There is a, another uh, apparently structure that they've built on the far side of the last river because they have been established for a while. They're also really, really old school. They're a long standing house, as old as the Starks, pretty much. And they have a long tradition of, of fighting. So they have extreme cold, probably more than any other houses, with the possible exception of the mountain clans. They have just as much fighting. Uh, they have done a lot of fighting directly against kings beyond the wall. They have a lot, a lot of their history is of stories where they assisted the Starks, assisted the Lord Commander, or fought them themselves, even in one or two spots. Let us, as we have done with these other northern houses, dream on what an umber skin changer might be like. A giant of a man with a bear at his side or a huge wolf. And I say a giant of a man because every single umber we've seen is huge. And that's why I say that they might have giant's blood. Because it's, it's just like the great John, his description is as tall as Hodor, but twice as wide. And the small John, his son, R.I.P., killed at the Red Wedding had them they they thought he would get bigger than his father he would outgrow his father eventually because he's so big and not fully grown yet like what <laughs> crow food going back to him has a snow bear cloak and an obsidian eye he has a dragon glass eye because he lost an eye and put a chunk of dragon glass in. that's kind of hardcore man and yeah that's hardcore <laughs> <laughs> and one of them wanted mance raider's skull for a drinking cup as part of his like deal to, to join join stannis you know it's like that's my terms i want i'll join you but i need man's raider's skull to drink out of that's that's what i need it's like no i don't need money i don't need honor <laughs> i want that damn skull <laughs> that dude he's getting it for me you know if drinking from a skull makes you hardcore i'm not gonna say <laughs> it does because i've drunk from a skull before so <laughs> <laughs> you have you have drunk from a skull many times not an actual human skull a replica though hmm. Mm. Hey, don't let detail, details get in the way of this awesome story. <laughs> That's true. A real skull would be just like dripping right out. I don't even know. Like you have to <laughs> do something to that. Like it's not that good of a drinking vessel. I don't you think. just have to be hardcore. You just have to deal with the drip. That's part yeah. of being hardcore. <laughs> uh, you're right, man. I mean, my lack of hardcoreosity is being exposed here. <laughs> you're I'm soft a soft core. southerner. You're but soft core. I am soft core. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it. Look at me. I have no hair whatsoever. Look at this. <laughs> arms. I have no bear's fur. <laughs> No, I'm not six feet tall, let alone seven. I'm not twice as wide as Hodor. <laughs> I'm the small as East, and it's not ironic. <laughs> I guess I'm more medium, really, but compared to those guys, I'm small. Yeah, like, you know, there's medium sized Rudy or regular sized Rudy. Regular sized Rudy. And Bob's Burgers. You're, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're average sized as East. <laughs> hey, it's, 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 you can give you a little alliteration there. It's average as East. At least it's AA, right? Well, I mean, Average, they, they, regular size yeah. Rudy is it has a, you know. as they are. You're right. Yeah, regular. Size. <laughs> <laughs> so the Umbers definitely get a lot of points there. They got the extreme weather, the the fighting, the size, the dedication. Like great job. Just the characters we've seen on screen have all been pretty hardcore. The stories we've heard about other ones have all been pretty hardcore. You've got like uh who was that other one um the drunken giant was another one that's from history like that was great john's great grandfather or something like that yeah they're just like every umber we hear about seems to be like this it's it's almost like something's more is going on there so i think they're pretty darn hardcore i don't know sean what do you think hard as hardcore as the mormons or maybe not quite i don't know mm. i think maybe i think i might give it to him i'm not sure Did just wasn't wasn't the great john didn't he get like his finger bent off by by gray wind two of them and he just right? was like and he's like oh, all right i'm on your team now let's drink more like yeah like, it was like that proved that rob was tough enough yeah like yeah 
<laughs> all right. Rob was like, I'm glad he thinks I'm tough enough because he's yeah. tougher than me. <laughs> it's pretty hardcore to lose a couple of fingers and not even like talk about it. Like, barely be like, phased. Oh, well. Yeah. So. Yeah. He was barely phased by that. Yeah. That is pretty, pretty gnarly. <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. <laughs> That's burned men like right there. Yeah. He just lost two fingers and was like, yeah. Yeah. And I was wanting to put an argument in for them earlier. So, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. We're, pretty here good. we are with a group that's farther north and dealing with, you know, in the same way I ordered that they maybe are borderline persecuted. The Umbers are maybe borderline persecuted. It may not quite the right word, but, you know, constantly being raided by uh, wildlings. And yeah, I might give it to the Umbers. Word. Yeah, it's it's a tough argument. It's it's really hard to pick the winner here out of all of them, especially when they're when their their climate situations are so different. Like you made a point that maybe cold is worse in some ways than heat, but it's not 100% certain. So yeah, 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 it's tough. So, and we'll be seeing more of the Umbers in the main story too. That's fun. Another house that, uh, or a place that has a few houses that also has a role to come in the story is Skagos. Let's look at them on the map. We did an episode on Skagos a long time ago, back in the days of Artos the Implacable, I think it was. Yeah, back then. Yeah. <laughs> Let's remind ourselves of the Skagosi, the Skags, the Stoneborn, as they are called, to differentiate them from the Ironborn, I suppose, with this sexy quote. Sexy quote. It's pretty sexy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A huge, hairy, foul-smelling folk, mm. some maesters believe the Skagosi to have a strong admixture of Ibanese blood, Others suggest that they may be descended from giants clad in skins and furs and untanned hides and said to ride on unicorns. The Skagosi are the subject of many a dark rumor. It is claimed they still offer human sacrifice to their werewoods, lure passing ships to, destru to destruction with false lights and feed upon the flesh of men during winter okay so that's an element of hardcore we hadn't quite run into yet cannibalism <laughs> i don't know if that counts as hardcore but it's certainly threatening and intimidating and yikes i think it might because and it's, it's definitely the reason they're cannibals is, is evidence of why they're hardcore which is that the lack of other forms of food so that certainly matters now we again we have this largeness huge and the hairiness which is suggested to be giant's blood or Ibanese blood, which might be the same thing because the Ibanese also, as we have de detailed on our episode on Ib, might also have giant's blood. So it might be like two different strains of ancient giant blood kind of coming back together here on Skagos. As you can see, it is farther north than Last Hearth. It is farther north than Mormont Keep uh, or all of Bear Island, really. And it is parts of it are farther north than the wall. So, eh, not all of it. So, but this is where we're limited in our knowledge. We don't know which part, you know, how much Southern Skagos is compared to Northern Skagos. But there are three noble houses that we know of there. Crowl, Stain, and Magnar. That's Stain, S-T-A-N-E, not like, you know, blood stain. <laughs> Although that would probably be appropriate. Driftwood Hall, King's House, and Deep Down are the name of their seats. We don't know if those are stone or timber or even that. Uh, you know, silly putty, maybe. But in a bookend to our point about high hermitage that we expect to learn a little more, given where the plot's going, the same is true here. Because as we referred to it in Valar Reredis, pack your bag, pack your bagos for Skagos, Davos. Because he's going there under the auspices of <laughs> Wyman Manderley to find Rickon. So we'll probably see it firsthand. I doubt we'll just see it in memory. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back when I was at Skagos. Like, what? Come on, show us. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so we'll, we might see it up front. Now, what did we call the Farwins, like Cthulhu, Viking skin changers? These are unicorn riding, hairy, Clegane sized, werewood sacrificing, skin changing, wrecker cannibals. They're, they're laying, their name is a lot longer. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean they're more hardcore, especially because, as the quote suggests, some of this is just rumor. It isn't actually necessarily true. Some of it might be exaggerated because we know the unicorns are probably goats, one or the single horn unigoats or some sort of woolly rhino offshoot, which is sort of a unicorn, but not the kind of unicorn we think of in standard, you know, 
well, there is no real standard unicorn, but it's not a nice, pretty white horse with a horn. You know, it's something much else. Yeah, I would think even if it was a real unicorn, that's not hardcore. That's fun and fanciful. <laughs> but these are hairy, like nasty if unicorns. It's a, if it's a hairy one horn goat, then that might look almost silly. You know, <laughs> if it's like kind of a small goat and a big person on it. I don't know. <laughs> it might. It might. Yeah. And so this we'll is all probably see. rumor anyway. I don't know. I don't buy these guys as being that hardcore. Well, we have seen the one, the goat. That is okay. that's something we've seen because Jon Snow had a, a wolf dream of Shaggy Dog. And he and Shaggy Dog was taking on one of these goats and it was a lot larger than him. And dire wolves are pretty darn big. So like they're almost human sized. So if not taller, they're taller than the children when they're full grown. So it, that part might be accurate. And they may have ridden these unicorns on land, like on the mainland during some other times. But it, you're right to be suspicious in general. So it is, again, like High Hermitage that we'll see it and weigh in again once we've seen it and get, got a better idea. But it definitely is. There's no doubt it's really cold. There's no doubt it's food scarce. And there's no doubt the people there have to be hardcore just to live. It's just a matter of how hardcore are they and how much of these hardcore attributes are actually true or exaggerated. But there's a there's no doubt they're at least somewhat hardcore, I'd say, right? Like yeah, it's pretty hard to yeah. it, se it seems like the rumors can't be that out of whack, especially given just to where they live. I mean, it's such a barren place. You know, I also imagine the cannibalism thing, it's probably not a regular practice. That's probably rumor, but probably based on something. There probably was a time when they were in there dire was, straits yeah. and they were freezing to death and didn't have food, and there were people that had died anyway. And they figured, well, we might as well eat them rather rather than die, right? Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is reasonable, very reasonable, even if it is sort of a taboo. But that's one thing that okay, might so make I'm you hardcore. Quote Sean, on this, cannibalism you can quote is me on very that. reasonable. Cannibalism <laughs> is very reasonable. Sean Pink, twenty twenty three. I don't mind being quoted on that. Okay, good. And and you know, and that's one thing. One one way you might think about uh, hardcore. One thing that might make someone hardcore is that something that would normally hold someone back doesn't hold you back. Whether mm -hmm. it's being weak, okay. well, I'm not held back because I'm strong. Being scared, I'm not held back because I'm brave. Being uh, cold or hot, I'm not held back because I can tough this out. Being starving to death, well, I'm not held back because I'll eat the dead bodies. I'm hardcore. <laughs> I'm not going to be held back by this taboo or this limitation. Or I'm going to survive one way or another. Yeah, yeah, that is part of that. A lot of it does get very much into just your survival instinct, like what you have to do, what you're willing to do to survive or what a culture is willing to do to survive or what a noble house that's trying to establish itself is willing to do to survive, which might involve some like shady politics or tricking people or, do, or, or you know, stealing labor or to use a modern term or something like that, which is a lot of, which is, to be honest, that's probably a lot of that probably happened because building a castle in some of these locations must have been really terrible and difficult. And it was probably done by a lot of people who were not very willing or not paid very well. Yeah. But um, but it wasn't explicitly slave labor, I guess, because, you know, like the Andals aren't bringing slaves into the deep desert of Dorne. I don't think uh, there's no story about that. There's no. But that doesn't mean the locals weren't like heavily leveraged in a very unfair, un, you know, yeah, dishonorable way. In fact, it seems very likely in a lot of these cases, maybe not so much with Skagos. Or Bear Island, but yeah, some of the other places, quite possibly. House Then, I want to throw out them as a mention as well, not and the Valley of the Thens as well, both of them, um, because it's pretty hardcore living way far. We talked about the Skagosi living farther north, but the Thens are even farther north than that, which doesn't know what automatically mean it's always colder. Let's keep that in mind, like an island on the the Bay of Ice there could easily be colder than something a little bit farther north because the Thens have a valley. It might be protected from some of the coldest winds or something like that. They might have some caves with some heat emanating from them or better, just better protection from the cold. They certainly have more fertility in the Valley of the Thens than a lot of other places have. They even have metalworking and things like that. So in some ways, they are more like a, a house or a kingdom, a small kingdom. So they should count. And they're spreading. Alice Karstark married Sigorn of Fen, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they how uh, Carhold is would have been maybe next on the list behind Umber and Glover and Mormont for being hardcore because they're so far north and have to deal with a lot of stuff. 
but it's kind of they're kind of in a weird spot of maybe not being what they were anymore because now they're kind of called house then because you know sigorn is the man in that marriage and they were married by melisandra so it's semi-traditional and it's still taking she's taking his last name or whatever but there's harry and karstark is still out there and we'll see but they're definitely worth a mention because they're very tough they're free folk who live in extreme extreme north they don't dealing with giants is not a factor of their history it's a factor of current times up until they all basically left the valley of the fens to flee the others so even even their homeland is in doubt right now but again there's pretty pretty little doubt that they're hardcore the tv show made them even made them weird and kind of kind of bind them with some of the other houses like they had the cannibalism on the tv show they're not cannibals in in the books to, as a reminder some of y'all may have forgotten that so but they are hardcore i'd say i think that's pretty fair to call them that they they live in extremes they deal with other free folk clans around them who are very violent a lot of times and they often have to prove themselves by doing things like climbing the wall and raiding into the you know raiding into the north and facing houses like the umbers and the mormons <laughs> and then surviving that and getting back home with loot or even like stealing a woman or something like that. How do you even do that? How do you carry a person over the wall? Like that, okay, that is kind of hardcore. I don't approve, but it's hardcore. Like, yeah, I'm going to carry this woman over my shoulder all the way back. Like, damn, that's, oof, that's, that's tough. <laughs> even if they didn't have to go over the wall, just like from how far north they are of the wall. Yeah. That distance, you know, just to, even if you weren't carrying a person at all or had the yeah. wall, just traversing that distance in that weather, that's hardcore. Yeah. And, there, and there's also a difference in like raiding for just like wealth and raiding for just basic food, which a lot of the free folk, that's what they're doing. They're just trying to, to eat, uh, which is an interesting like ethical conundrum, but not really part of our discussion today. It's certainly interesting when you're stealing to survive versus stealing to thrive. Those are definitely different things, I think. It might be a little bit of a tangent too, but I have thought about this before too. Sometimes they might even steal things that aren't food, like a sword. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there's a decent chance they use Deal. that yeah. sword to turn into a plow or whatever else. You know, they just they need tools. They need metal and tools and stuff that, yeah. that can That's allow true. them to continue to make food. So there are very few forages north of the wall. It's been said and many times, and it's observable from the northern the chapters beyond the wall. We don't actually see one up front. And the, the access to those has probably been lost since they've all been abandoned as they flee south. So that's that's that. That's our episode, folks. You may have noticed, uh, let's talk briefly about some patterns. A lot of the houses we mentioned are islands. Very few of them are towards the center of the continent. We have mostly avoided the Riverlands and the Reach in the West. We did talk about them briefly, but there wasn't a lot to, to add to this topic. And it's interesting to think about the Andal culture permeated where it did, and it wasn't able to penetrate some of these more remote regions. And this is why these cultures were tougher and stronger and more rooted in their ways. It's not so easy to displace a tough, hardcore culture. They're more likely to stick. They're more likely to be the way they are. They look at you as weaker. They're like, I don't want to be like you. You're weaker. <laughs> uh, like, think about the real world hardcore cultures that became that way because of certain advantage they had in toughness that they lost over the years like the mongols the mongols started in mongolia where it's really tough the steps make you are a real killer be killed type place survival of the fittest but once you conquer china and you're ruling chinese cities that are super rich and well developed and have been so for a long time yeah then it's not so hard well the ruling might be it's different it's a different kind of hard but it's not hardcore <laughs> it's it's political being hardcore, tougher right? doesn't yeah. help you in that situation yeah. right not physically tougher anyway i suppose mental toughness it would yeah but which might help which would be helpful to ruling uh you know dealing with people uh but ultimately that's something you know first talking about what makes you hardcore in the first place it's it's not that it's it's the, <laughs> the place you came from and so that's why dorn in the north and the iron islands is still kind of have either their own culture or a very different cult or or a homogenized or a different variation on like dorn still worships the seven but they have very different like gender orientation and sexuality and ethnicity than mainland central Westeros and the North is obviously different from first man culture and the Iron Islands is obviously different. So th I think it's their cultural toughness, that in inborn hardcoreness that has 
also kept them the way they are for so long. It's why they're, they haven't gotten softer because of the reasons that made them hard in the first place are still in play for the most part. And some houses that would have been considered hardcore in the past have since gotten softer because times have improved their political situation, their wealth, whatever. I would say that that should be the goal to not be hardcore. I don't think we should aspire. <laughs> yeah. All hardcore people I wish agree. they were soft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they you can't can, be can... because they have this tough environment they're in. But if they could snap their fingers and make the weather nice and have wine to drink and food at their hand and like, I, I, I mean, maybe some people are so stuck in their ways they wouldn't accept that. But I'm not aspiring to be hardcore i'm just i'm aspiring to be soft <laughs> yeah i'd like to have like good health but i don't want to like have to earn it through like heart like extreme hardships like yeah i just like working out that's my hardship like i don't, I don't yeah, need I to like run around the neighborhood back, back and not run in the arctic yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly like that's that's tough enough for me i think <laughs> how about the rest of y'all what, what what counts as toughness for you what types of toughness did we not bring up what are some maybe some things like we didn't talk about emotional and mental toughness as much Although I think those are implied, like it's in order to not covered with the broken. sisters and the Mormonts and stuff like that too, as well. Cause like yeah. that, that you have to be emotionally tough to deal with your, your homes being pillaged all the time. That's true. Deal with loss, deal with like the, yeah. Like, you know, one thing I actually, one point I want to make is that, that I skipped over by accident. I'm just remembering here as we're making our way out the Northern, uh, cultural phenomenon of suicide by hunting when you mm, go out mm. in winter to not have to give your family another mouth to feed i don't know of any similar type cultural trend or tradition in other parts of the country and i kind of doubt that it's the southern part of the north it probably happens less so the farther north and the north the more likely this is to happen think about how much food and umber eats because we talk about how large they are you can almost guess that maybe the Umbers or the Mormons or one of these houses started that because they'd be the be under the most pressure in that regard. Like taking a huge, a seven foot man out of the equation. That's a lot of food you save. Like a guy twice the size of Hodor. That's a lot of mouths you could feed. Like he probably the eats seven four foot times man is, the food of a regular guy. When a seven foot man is still healthy and able to go get food, you want him around, right? Yeah. Like, but eventually it gets to the point where he can't get as much food as he needs to eat. And Other people rather than important. being a burden on his family, his community, he takes it on himself to remove it. Like, you know, I can imagine there being some some debate around that topic, but it is. He should uh, go to Skagos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of food, a lot of meat in them bones. Exactly. <laughs> real, real ecosystem going Giants there. on the menu tonight, boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. That is hardcore. Anyway, you look at it. just that tradition of, of I'm going to go freeze to death <laughs> rather than yeah. burden my family that you got to have real. And that's emotional, mental toughness to, and some physical toughness to do that. I mean, oof. and whatever sort of morality or social taboo might be around that. I prefer that hardcore to salt wife hardcore. You know? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Not I'm so only... tough. I'll kidnap a woman to marry her. Yeah. <laughs> My location is so remote. I have to kidnap women. Like, oh, I guess you're hardcore. Like this guy's so <laughs> tough. He's starved to death to save his family. That's the hardcore. That's I more want. hardcore. At least it's definitely a more honorable version of hardcore. It's probably yeah. more hardcore too. Like he's, yeah, he's taking more suffering on himself for someone else. Yeah. yeah. yeah or just go. in general, it's more suffering period, whether it's for him or for someone else. It's just more suffering that he's invited. So not only are they tougher from living in these harsh environments, not only is their culture more stubborn because there may be a little more pr pride in being that tough, especially in a world where martial prowess is and thus toughness is so prized. They're also very well equipped to defend them against invasion. You have these tough people. It's pretty hard to beat them, especially in their own turf and drive them out when you, your people are not acclimated to those regions like they have such an advantage in the mountains when their people can handle the climate and the heat and yours can't and they know where the food is and the water is and yours don't and your people are even worried are just worried about where the next water is going to come from so that also is a, is a, i think a very living breathing part of george's world building is that the regions that have held on to their traditions are it is a reason for it there's a reason these cultures have held on to their beliefs their traditions their whether you want to call it stubbornness or just it just works out that way. It's just the, the, these all these multiple factors 
come together to create this environment. I find it pretty fitting to a lot of what we know about the real world. So, Shay, it looks like you did a little poll there, huh? Yes, I sure did. You can only do four options on YouTube. So I had to just, you know, limit myself to which options I included. Um, I asked, what house is most hardcore? Uller got 48%. Corgile got 0%. And someone <laughs> said, we associate them with Argyle now. <laughs> so they can't be hardcore. You ruined uh, it, Sean. You ruined you it. You ruined Corgile <laughs> for everyone, I think, um, with that one. So they got 0%. No, everyone who wanted to vote for a Dornish house was just like Uller. Uller, Uller. got all the Dornish um, votes. They got all and the then, votes. <laughs> um, but so I thought maybe the vote would be split, which would mean Dorn wouldn't win. I was worried mm. about that. But no, everyone just... Threw their vote behind the Uller. Uh, Mormont with 36%. Very strong. Uh, and Farwind with 16%. Mm. Yeah. So I would be curious to see it just the Northern House's vote. Like, maybe I should do another quick poll and I just do the Northern Choices or something. But I, anyways, maybe we could do more polls. But I thought... Put Umber against Uller. Put just Umber <laughs> against Uller? Yeah. Okay. The sure, winner of that know. one versus what I think might be the winner of the other one. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, what? The winner of the winner other? of the poll you did versus what I think might be the winner of a separate poll of the oh, okay. one. I think Umber might win that. So let's see how they fare against each other. Yeah. Okay. You can make it more complicated if you want. I could add more. I'll just do the two though. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, Owen, Umber. Okay, we'll put Umber on there. Start poll. Okay, that'll go while we wrap things up. I'll let y'all know what the answer is. Um, All right. Okay, so the true uh, guilty Undertaker sent the question says, "How many Florida man things have the Baratheons done over the years?" <laughs> that, of course, is in reference to our comparing the Stormlands to Florida. <laughs> Quite a few, actually. That's a very good undertake. There. Florida guilty man, under make the eight. <laughs> <laughs> Florida man thing. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hammering away. Uh, what is this like? Drinking, lots of drinking and fighting. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of Florida man there. Come on, Uller fans. Come out and vote for Uller. So, Uller's winning right now. Trivia answer. Which houses were founded by Andals out of all the ones we talked about today? The answer is basically the second and third houses we talked about. We started with Dane, but then Uller and Corgile. So Uller and Corgile, both founded by Andals. So that is the answer. If you got one or both of those, congratulations. And yeah, so let's, uh, let's say adios and shout out a few patrons right sean yeah i love to read off the the names of our patrons and as always i'll do a few old and a few new the maid of silver spring nice sherry of skein last of the long night archaeologist and wielder of untested hypothesis of larian steel trowel with a dragon blade handle that was dragon so bone awesome. handle oh did it's i say a, it wrong dragon bone dragon handle, blade sorry. yeah uh, say it again <laughs> A dragon blade handle would be a uh, <laughs> that would be hardcore. A hard, a, a that would be hardcore. Please You're holding it by the dragon blade. Yeah, you need gloves, Valyrian steel gloves for that. Please say that sentence again. Uh, let's see. Sherry of Skein, last of the light. Sherry of Skein, last of the long night archaeologists and wielder of untested hypothesis of Valyrian steel trowel with a dragon bone handle. Nice. <laughs> Lord Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Green Shield. Your, uh, next name, to be clear, this isn't a caveat of the past one. You are a secret Targaryen, captain of the Borica Machoteros. Man, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Machoteros? I think I'm, I'm going to guess you massacred that. The yes. Borica yeah. Ma <laughs> Machoteros, I would guess. But, yeah. but that's okay. You know, it's, it's, Machoteros. That's probably would have been hard to look up how to say that. So, you know. uh, yes. <laughs> And finally, Sir Zeke of House Boyat, the Knight of Maple Tree. Nice. Right on. Cool. Uh, we don't have an episode next week. It's American Thanksgiving, and we will not be recording, but we'll be back the week after with a voted on episode, so we can't tell you what it is yet. And a reminder, this is a good time to sign up for our Patreon. Go to historyofwesteros.com for a link, or just go straight to patreon.com slash historyofwesteros. We're going to have a lot of votes coming up soon, a lot of opportunity for y'all to affect what episodes we're doing in the near future like i said earlier in the episode we're going to try to get way ahead on our schedule map it out farther in advance and share that with y'all as as it becomes more completed so y'all can know what more to expect from us in the future and that will also like i said improve our 
process, our videos, our podcasts, everything will look a little better and sound a little better because we'll be a little more prepared. And you all will be able to weigh in a little more in advance, which will be nice. A little more questions from you, a little more feedback, a little more just back and forth between y'all in general. That'll be good. And uh, I want to leave you all with some thanks and some additional episodes that you might want to check out that were related to this one. We have an episode on Ancient Dorn with Elio Garcia. We have the Children of the Forest um, episode that's pretty relevant. We have the Neck slash Kranigman episode. We have uh, episodes on the Free Folk. Uh, not a specific one, but lots of different ones mixed in here with our Valor Revitas. Um, I know I forgot one or two here. We have an episode on Skagos. We have the episode on the Giants. It's called When Giants Roamed. We have a Patreon episode called uh, The Buildings of Brandon, which discusses the possibility that Brandon used giant slave labor and just what buildings he was actually responsible for versus what ones were actually were credited to him. So lots of related topics to this one. I encourage you to enjoy those, uh, even if you've heard them already. And thank you as well to Nina for her notes. Thank you to all of you who are already signed up on Patreon or on Spotify. You can also join us on Spotify as a Spotify subscriber. It just rolls right into your Spotify subscription, gets added on top. So pretty simple. Works pretty similar to a Patreon subscription. Uh, doesn't give you voting access. We don't have the means to put that on Spotify, but it does give you all our bonus episodes, which is probably the most important thing. Thanks as well to Joey uh, and Jesse for the music, especially Joey who came up with the original music and Michael Klarfeld for our video intro and all the rest of you who spread the word or send us love or anything like that. We really appreciate it. We're very lucky to be doing this and we want to keep it going. So Ashe, you ran one more quick poll there. Is that what, what that number means there? Yes. Indeed. So it looks like this, the heads, the heads up poll, Umber beat Uller when it was one, one to one. Umber wasn't on the poll before. Oh, that's right. It was Mormont. Oh, okay. Good call. So it looks like in some ways, arguably Umber is even over Uller. Similar names, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Umber Uller. If you mash them up, Uller Umber. So I guess what we have to say is it's not fully determined. We're, there's still some debate on who the most hardcore house is. Our ability to I think we'll put polls this... is not quite able to capture it. Well, I think, yeah, we can't because we can't have more than four options. But I think what we should do is for the podcast upload, we can do a heads up poll between Uller and Umber since they won the two polls and we'll see what the larger audience votes. OK, that's a good idea. Uller yeah, we in, in fact, if you're our Spotify listener, you should be aware of that, that there are occasionally polls attached to episodes, if not questions. So you can look at the description of the episode and find that if you're if you're interested. It's also got a sign up link for our um Spotify subscribers. So lots of good information there for you to participate more directly. But if you just want to listen and move on, that's cool too. That's what a lot of people do and nothing wrong with that. And we will indeed see you next time for more of History of Westeros podcast. And you know what to do in the meantime. Valar, reread us.